Um, in late, <laughs> Brian. Yes, sir. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm calling the meeting to order for October the 10th. Um, roll call. Supervisor Foy. Yeah. Supervisor Long. Yeah. Supervisor Bennett. Here. Supervisor Parks. Here. Supervisor Zaragoza. Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Thank you. And what I'd like to do uh, at this time is uh, just take a, a moment of silence, but we're not going to start yet until we share a couple of words. But um, as you know, we'd like to take a moment to reflect on the recent tragedy that happened in Las Vegas at the 91 Harvest uh, Music uh, Festival. Sadly, as we all know, on October 1, our nation experienced the largest mass shooting in U.S. history. At that time, you know, we, as, we, as we progress, uh, here in, Vin in Ventura County, we know we had quite a few people that were injured and some that were lost here also. In this situation, you know, we have a lot of positive aspects. However, we also look for the actions of the first responders, people that jump right into action when something happens. And also, you know, some of the attendees that were there were very instrumental in helping out. So I'd like to share my deepest condolences to all the friends and families from those victims. And additionally, as we all know, as we heard this morning up north, I understand that we lost an additional 11 lives in, in a major fire up north, and we're also experiencing another major fire in Orange County. But before we take the, uh, the moment of silence, um, um, a Supervisor Parks would like to share a couple of words. Thank you. Um, just think about the tragedy in Las Vegas and how we've been here too many times to discuss um, close to home, we had Isla Vista, we had San Bernardino, and obviously across the nation, Sandy Hook and Orlando and, and Columbine and now Las Vegas. And we talk about, you know, why, and they don't know why in Las Vegas at this point, uh, whether it's someone who's deranged or uh, mentally ill or just mean. We, we don't know, but there is one common denominator in all that, and that is access to guns, um, semi-automatic rifles, what appears to be almost a machine gun in Las Vegas. And the tragedy here is felt very much, particularly um, in my district, where we've had two people from Thousand Oaks that were murdered. So I just wanted to express our incredible heartbreak for all the victims, but especially call out Carrie Galvin, a 31-year-old mother of three children, ages 10, 4, and 2, and just what a, a light she was to so many people that she served and, and knew and so much loved and a pain that's going to, you know, never go away, I know, for the, the family. And Laura Shipp, a 50-year-old mother also, a single mother who raised her son by herself, very, very close to her son who was a, uh, is a Marine. And I just uh, want to make sure that we at the board close in honor of these two, especially, um, and give our, our heartfelt um, Condolences to the families. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Bennett. Mm -hmm. I, I also have a connection to a uh, victim in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and I appreciate this moment of silence as, as we get started uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, and I don't think you can think about this tragedy and, and, and uh, the others and, and not point out that uh, more Americans uh, have been killed by gun-related uh, 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 incidents in the United States than in all of the wars that the United States has been involved in since the Revolutionary War. Take all of those wars together, all the people who have been killed, and there have been more killed in gun-related incidents in the United States. And that's a shocking statistic that 
other countries don't have, and it's, I think it's a, we have to to begin to reflect uh, on that. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Long. No, oh, you're in in attendance. He just oh, walked sorry. in. <laughs> um, yes, we also um, in Almar district uh, lost Chris Hazencomb. He was the actually 58th victim in the tragedy. He was shielding his best friend's wife after the shooting started. And his mother, he, she stated that uh, he evidently saved her from being hit so that she could raise her two boys with her husband. Um, there was a difficult dis, uh, decision to disconnect the ventilator that was keeping her son alive. Um, at this point, I would like to thank all those uh, first responders and other people that were just in the community mm -hmm. helping those to make sure that everyone was safe. And uh, that's one thing that we should always be looking at, is making sure wherever we are that we are safe, because we cannot mm -hmm. control what uh, mm -hmm. others may do, but we can control what we do. And so that's, that's something we need to make sure. You know, we take things for granted a lot, um, but be thankful for what we have, mm -hmm. and to make sure that we are always looking to make sure that each other are safe. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Foy. Yeah, I too. I appreciate this and the opportunity. And we had, um, you know, Susan Smith. She was a uh, administrator over at one of our middle schools in, in town, and it, it was known by a whole lot of people. Um, wonderful, wonderful woman. And it's always tough. You just go and you think you're having a good time, and things happen. No matter what you want to say, there's evil in the world, and uh, evil, you know, is evil. And that's what you see. And it's it's been tough for our country, tragic. And I appreciate you bringing the fires up, too. Right. I grew up in Santa Rosa, so I know a lot of those that's people, right. a lot of my friends, and my brother's sister-in-law lost her home, and a lot, a lot of people. So there's a lot of tragedy. What we see in the Gulf, there's a lot going on in our country right now, and uh, it's it's difficult, so people are, are suffering. Uh, but uh, when you see the thing in Las Vegas, it's mm -hmm. just even tougher, when you're just out having fun. It's not a, not a natural thing. But there's evil. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brent. Michael? <coughs> Thank you, Chair Zaragoza. Well, in response to this horrible tragedy, we do see a lot of humanity, and, and a great example of that is our local Red Cross, who was uh, reaching out uh, to uh, support victims in the Family Assistance Center in Las Vegas, as well as reaching out to local families here uh, to provide uh, financial support, mental health, and, and spiritual counseling as well. So we very much appreciate their efforts. And also, we had many uh, from our county family who were there, from the Sheriff's Department, firefighters, DA investigators, uh, all of whom uh, turn right around and help the victims. Uh, so they're out there serving our community uh, for us at all times. So thank, thank you, Michael. Much. I'd additionally, I'd like to share that uh, from Oxnard, we had a Mrs. Sanchez, too, that was shot also in Vegas. And my understanding is that we had Oxnard firefighters that were there attending the, the uh, Harvest Festival. And one of the firefighters uh, actually saved uh, one individual that was right next to him. And it happened to be that the individual was from Ventura. And who was to know after... 20 some thousand people there, and the next person he saved was from Ventura. So, our firefighter from, from Oxnard. So, again, you know, let's, let's take a, a moment of silence here uh, in respect for all those uh, individuals. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing, uh, Supervisors and Michael. Our next item is item number four, and that's the minutes of the meeting of a special district governed by the Board of Supervisors of September 26. Do we have a motion on it? Okay, we need a please vote. <clears throat> and that's approved. And Michael, we have uh, agenda review, item five. Thank you, Chair. Item 13. Fire Protection District approval of a SEMA Fire Prevention and Safety Grant Award for 1,400 smoke alarms and 30 smoke alarm kits. A revised board letter has been submitted. In addition, agenda page 4 was updated to reflect the changes in the board letter. Item 32, Human Services, approval of a grant application to fund a housing and disability income advocacy program. A revised board letter has been submitted. And finally, item 33, CEO's Office, approval of flexible benefits program and health benefits rates and contract providers. <coughs> For plan year 2018, a revised board letter has been submitted, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we need a motion. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask that we pull item 13. I know we have a public speaker here who, who wants to speak on this item. Um, okay. And um, 
Okay. Item 13. And also, I'm going to recuse myself from item 19. I have some property located next to that, the uh, levies and, and auction art. Okay. Um, also, to, can I put on the record for item 21? Uh, there is a, it states that there, the state notified us that there was a 4,000, um, I'm trying to find it right this minute. Okay, 4,000 gallons on 7640 Pine Grove Road, uh, the Ventura Ranch KOA. Uh, the state stated that there was a sewage leak of 4,000. However, that was incorrect. We had to um, put it on the records because that's what the state stated. However, that was incorrect. So I wanted to make sure that's on the record. And the amount was what? The amount? 4,000 4, gallons of sewage, which didn't happen. Yeah. Um, what was it, 40 gallons? It, it was not a, it was not a um, that sewage amount. leak at all. There were no 4,000 gallons oh. let go. Okay. It okay. Was so I'm making sure that no one thinks that that even happened. So I'm That's a, yes, a tremendous yes. amount. I, I get well, sensitive the, to those things. Thank you for that correction. Then. Okay, our next item is a... Oh, okay, we need a second, and then I'll go ahead and second that. And let's please vote. Okay, and that's approved. Now we got some, you know, we had all this sad, you know, motions and, and concerns, and, and I really appreciate that. But we now have a, a moment of inspiration. We have a Tara. Tara's coming up. Uh, Tara is the Director of uh, County Animal Services, is here to honor and recognize the month of October as Adopt a Shelter Dog. To date, uh, Tara has a special heartwarming story <coughs> about how Ventura County Animal Service helped amend two broken hearts. I'll take that one. 1,600 miles apart, <laughs> learning about a dog named Seuss, you know, that apparently his, there was a tragedy that happened in Kansas, uh, and so forth and so forth, so Tara. And also, I, I understand that we have a, a little partner there by the name of Cinnamon with us. Cinnamon over oh, oh. here. Oh, and I, I don't know the name of the other one. This is Josie. Josie? Josie and Cinnamon. Tara? Well. Good. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Super, or Chair Zaragoza, members of the board, and CEO Powers. I'm Tara Diller, Director of Van Ventura County Animal Services. I will introduce the uh, pets and people behind me <laughs> at some point. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the moment of inspiration today. Well, I'm here to shamelessly plug October as Adopt a Shelter Dog Month. My presentation today is not your typical adoption story. Rather, a tale of how a shelter dog named Zeus, who was adopted from Ventura County Animal Services, significantly touched the lives of so many people across the nation. This is an adoption story intertwined with excitement and joy confusion and sadness, compassion and healing, and divine intervention. This story also exemplifies the community spirit and the great people of Ventura County. In early August, tragedy struck a Kansas family when Jan and Gary Shusky's son, Matt, was shot and killed in a senseless homicide. He was only 34 years old. The suspected killer stole Matt's truck, then kidnapped his beloved best friend, Zeus, an Australian shepherd, and eventually made his way to California, where local authorities found Matt's pickup truck in Los Angeles. Law enforcement cut up, caught up with the suspect after he spent some time in, nor in a Northern California hospital. Zeus, however, was not with him. The dog was found tethered to a tree near the train station in Ventura, where the suspect boarded a northbound train and left Zeus. This left Zeus with no known connection to the victim or to the crime. He was a nameless, abandoned dog with no tags, no microchip, who was quickly adopted after his stray period, of course. Back in Kansas, however, following Matt's murder, the family began searching for Zeus. Family friends created a Facebook page called Help the Matt Shusky Family, which only had 1,000 followers. Mm -hmm. Somehow a community, a Ventura County community member and a previous VCAS adopter, Jan, who's behind me here, stumbled upon this Facebook page. She then shared a picture with them of an Australian shepherd that we had at our Camarillo campus, suggesting that it might be Zeus, 
She also indicated that he had been adopted out. This one photo immediately prompted Kansas authorities to swiftly act. Mm -hmm. After speaking with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and the Ottawa Sheriff's Department throughout Labor Day weekend, we did conclude that the dog we had in our care was in fact Zeus. The following Tuesday, I met with the family who adopted Zeus from us and explained the horrific circumstances surrounding this special dog. His new family had taken such good care of him. They had already enrolled him in training classes. They took him to the San Diego beaches where he had his first puppuccino. He's <laughs> having a and, great time. <laughs> and brought him to school with them at Channel Islands University. They bonded with him considerably. He was attending the university, then. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> they are, and they are the <laughs> ideal adopters. That dog really received a California experience during his seven days with the adopters. <laughs> but they had no idea that, that he had suffered such a traumatic loss. After presenting the family with documentation relating to the case, they agreed to release Zeus back into our custody so that we could reunite him and Matt's parents in Kansas. I immediately made contact with the Shusky family, and might I say they're just very, very kind, kind folk. Mm. Matt's mother told me, getting Zeus back is like bringing my son home. Mm. Since his death, Matt's family has gone through an unbelievable ordeal, so the least we could do was bring Zeus home. One of our cherished volunteers, Sarah King, happened to be taking a road trip just two days later near Kansas, and she agreed to transport Zeus 1,600 miles to be reunited with his family. Three days later, Zeus was home. He had been abducted in Kansas on October 12th and was returned to his home state on September 10th after enduring the unthinkable. I'd like to share with you a short video of Zeus being reunited with his family, but first I'd like to give special acknowledgement to our local heroes. Jan, the person who shared Zeus's story. Jan, if you want to stand up, please. <laughs> Scott and Ayla, the amazing adopters and amazing human beings who are in school right now, so they couldn't make it this morning. We'll, we'll give them a clap. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> Randy Friedman, who opened his home and allowed Zeus to stay there so he didn't have to go back into a kennel until we got Zeus back home. That's fantastic. And this is Josie. <laughs> I'd like to thank the entire VCAS team for doing what they do best, caring for our pets. And I'd like to thank Sarah King, the volunteer extraordinaire and transportation aficionado. She, she yeah. did an amazing, amazing thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, she could not be with us this morning either. Yeah. Before we play the video, I'd like to dedicate this moment of inspiration to Gary, Jan, and Lane yeah. in honor of their son, Matt. And before, you, and before you play the video while we have maximum attention, I think we would just want to remind everybody again how important it is that everybody try to adopt animals from our shelter. We have incredible staff there that are truly Absolutely. knocking themselves out to try to make sure we don't have to euthanize animals. And you guys are doing great work, and I just want everybody in this room and everybody in county government that's, that's listening and getting ready to watch this video to remind their friends and family and everybody else to try to go and if you're going to get a dog get it from ventura county animal shelter no place else right that's 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 what you that's the best contribution you can make uh to animals in ventura county thank you very much Tara. thank you Tara, and your staff thank too you. uh, supervisor long I just wanted to say thank you very much. I stopped by the shelter because it's on my way to certain events, and I'm always amazed by how much the employees do. Um, there's 30 people, you know, wanting to get um, an animal the other day, and there's only two people working at the front desk trying to get as many dogs and cats and bunnies and all them out because they know that it's better to be in a home than in a shelter. So any way we can have our community reach out and help with that, the better, as the community wants to make sure that these it's a no-kill zone. We also need to make sure that they help us as well. 
because um, we know that it's, anyone is better in a home than out on the streets or in a shelter. Thank so, you. So, thank you. so thank you have that video you want to share with us? I'll yeah. also just say that we love having the guests, the four-legged guests. <laughs> oh, us? Four-legged guests. Oh. <laughs> yes. So come, come in board meeting, please. <laughs> thank you so much. If we could play a video, please. Okay. Anybody go on campus? <laughs> So much, you know. That Are you ready to go on Kansas? Come on, go home, buddy. Come on. He's running around now and, uh, over in Kansas. I speak to his mother nearly daily, Matt's uh -huh. mother. And um, yes, Zeus has siblings now, which he did not have before. He lived on a ranch. Uh, he wasn't a great working dog, so he slept with his dad in, in, his, in the bed instead of chasing cattle. <laughs> uh, so he has new siblings, and he's getting along great. He's doing and, amazing. And I want to thank Dr. Jen and also... Uh, Sarah King, you know, she's not here today, but that's outstanding for an individual to do that. Took the dog all the way across the U.S. to back to, to, to the folks there. That's just unbelievable. And yes, Randy, yes. right? Yes. Thank you so much for, for keeping the dog, you know, and, and helping out. This is it's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Supervisors? And I just wanted to say I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all the volunteers. I know that's we right. have our, our great employees, but we have a huge amount of volunteers, mm -hmm. and they, they do things... They just do it out of their heart. I really appreciate that there's no money that we can pay them for, for thanking you. And, so, and, thank and Tara, I know you're doing a great job with the no-kill, and I know you're up to here with work. But thank you for your, you and your staff for doing an outstanding job for, for the County of Ventura with the no-kill. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank my staff and volunteers as well. They Absolutely. really are keeping us going. So thank you for this honor. Michael. I would say this is an extraordinary story, but it really just captures the spirit of animal services and your volunteers. It's work that you do every day because you care so much about these animals. So just thank you for that. And I, I want to see how the clerk's going to record the dog's comments in the minutes. That's, that's, that's <laughs> spelling yeah, lots to say. <laughs> thank you again. Excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our Next item is uh, the consent item, and we have, uh, I'm going to recuse from 19, and uh, we had item 21. Uh, what, what other item uh, did we? Thirteen. Should, uh, yes, I so just 13. made a comment. Thir why, don't we, why don't we pull those, and then when we're done with those, and you can walk out. Okay. Yeah. Okay, item 13 first. Who had uh, approved the, Okay. You can vote on this. Okay. Okay. And one, one more. Thirteen. Let's go to thirteen.
Well, good morning, Chair Zaragoza, members of the board, Mr. Powers, good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Masoud Aragi, Fire Marshal with the Fire Protection District. I'm here this morning for your approval to accept the FEMA grant, uh, fire, sa fire Prevention and Safety, in amount of $157,000 for the purchase or acquisition of 1,400 uh, long life smoke alarms and 30 smoke alarm kit for the deaf and hard of hearing uh, for the fire district smoke alarm distribution program. You know, I'd like to share a couple of words, you know, and, and uh, I'll let you, you know, I, the firefighters have done such a great job also with the Red Cross. You know, we uh, actually went out to Nylon Acres a while back and and we have, I can't remember how many homes there, I think a couple hundred homes and maybe we probably placed maybe 190 smoke detectors and all, also in South Oxnard. So we, can you imagine the amount of lives that we've saved because of that? You know, I, I think it's an excellent program. Just, and also Fort excited. Wainimi. And Wainimi, too. Thank you. So was there better? Yeah, it, it, it included in this grant are 30 uh, smoke alarms for the deaf and hard of hearing. That's correct. I really appreciate the fire department's efforts, both for the grant and in particular for the deaf and hard of hearing here. Um, you know, there are 72,000 deaf and hard of hearing people in the Tri-Counties uh, area. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so appreciate the fire department and I know that mm -hmm. we have uh, uh, Julian Feld and she's the executive director of Tri-County GLAAD uh, and uh, her colleague Hal are here and I know that they want to speak uh, about this and uh, their appreciation of the fire department also. Thank you. Okay, let me see. No? Okay. Can we go ahead and have Ms. GLAAD? Yeah. You want to go ahead and share some? Go ahead. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, why don't you, can, if she moves over a little bit so that you need to be in front of the microphone. You yeah, be, uh, okay. You oh, yeah, of course, I forgot. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. And I do have three deaf people from the community here. We have Elaine, mm -hmm. and we have George, and Hal, who's our advocate, who plans on working with the fire uh, people, Karina, for two years to get this opportunity for having over a thousand deaf people and hard of hearing people who own homes. Mm -hmm. And now we have 72,000 people and counting and more and more people are buying homes. So I think we're becoming more uh, savvy in dealing with purchasing homes now. So um, I want to thank everyone and also the fire department for making this happen. We can't thank you enough, but thank you. And thank you Hal for working with them. So I'm thrilled about this. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Move the recommended action. Okay, good. Second. Thanks for calling that out, Steve. I'll get second then. Thank you. And we need one more vote. And then uh, next item is what, item 19? Mm -hmm. You need a okay. <laughs> so, we're, are we calling 19 out? Linda, you wanted to? No, he just needed. Oh no, he's just out. Oh, he's vote. just out of it. Okay. So we just need a vote. Call vote. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, we're good. John, you could have kept going. <laughs> <laughs> And again, you know, I recuse myself because I have some property near that, uh, that location. Okay, on 21, we just, we're okay. All righty, so. So our next item is uh, corn mm -hmm. comments and um, supervisor parks. Public oh, comments. Too many Christmas. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. Public comments. And uh, we have two speakers, Monica Gray and Lamont Pearson. Good morning, Board of Supervisors, CEO Powers, I'm Chair Zaragoza. I'm here today to um, inform you all of a community event 
that I'm really proud to help with every year. It's the Harvest Moon Spectacular. It's held in downtown Ventura, and it's done in conjunction with the Downtown Ventura Merchants Association, along with my kids' school. Open Classroom is a K-5 through school on the campus of Blanche Reynolds, and it's a school that really likes art and music and field trips. And as you all know, if you want all those things, you kind of have to fundraise for them. So this is our biggest fundraiser of the year, and it also teaches our kids how to be helpers. Seeing um, you know, that moment of inspiration from the animal shelter was really cool because my kids, through their participation at Open Classroom, have learned to help with this event, raise money for the programs that they love, and also um, to learn to be community helpers. My daughter's gone out, and several businesses have generously donated silent auction items. So I've also left a copy of um, that letter here. If anyone or any local business owners are interested in donating to that, all of the proceeds do go right back into the school. And the participation rate in downtown Ventura has been very, very positive, and I'm super appreciative of that. Um, I have been doing a little bit of research on the value of volunteerism, and there's a website that I was checking out called volunteeringinamerica.org, and it says that in the state of California, the value of one hour of volunteer service, like if they were being paid, is actually $28.46. So when you take a look at the the efforts of all the volunteers in every organization that kind of you know keeps Ventura County running, that's a lot, um, and I think that if we encouraged more volunteerism and actually showed people the value of just that one hour of service, it might prompt more people to you know, want to chip in maybe one or two hours a time in whatever makes them happy because organizations like Food Share, um, ARC, even the animal services, I'm sure that they could always use more volunteers. And in programs like the Welfare to Work program, um, it used to be that volunteer service could be included, but due to federal budget cuts and the way that they do things a little higher up the chain, um, those are kind of discouraged. But I would really encourage you guys to, um, to possibly revisit that and ask if that could be included again, because rather than forcing someone you know, to attend some job program that they don't really like, um, or take a job that they could end up in for years that isn't really well suited to their needs, they could do volunteer service for a little while and see if maybe that's the field that they want to go in. Or, you know, you could get volunteers for life because they start out doing it just... Um, I have a friend that had to do volunteer service to um, satisfy some legal requirements, and he ended up volunteering for food share long after his requirement was met because he really loved doing it, and he realized that um, little old people were carrying huge, heavy boxes of canned food, and when you have able-bodied adults that can do it and want to do it and help with it, why not encourage that? So it's just, that's my two cents. I would really like to see more volunteer efforts encouraged because it's actually worth quite a bit if you break it down per hour. Thank you. Have Thank a nice you, day. Thank you. Uh, Lamont Pearson. You know, it just occurred to me that during my whole life, maybe things have happened to a point of maybe enough hasn't happened to me. I don't know what else to say about that, but my life has brought me here, and I'm still talking about the things that have happened to me that were wrong towards me, things that I didn't deserve, and... It almost made me sick to my stomach to watch the district attorney a few weeks ago ask for support for a program that's supposed to deter people from uh, uh, being prosecuted or, or things of that sort. And I thought that there was already a program like that in place, like called probation or, or something like that. Okay which is a program that I was put on, that now it goes from uh, full probation to informal probation because, well, 
I shouldn't have been pro put on probation in the first place. But that's my point of view. Okay. But I'm only here because I haven't been heard. Nobody has heard me. Nobody has took my point of view and said, hey, you know what? We're sorry. I haven't gotten an apology from nobody about anything. And I just watched him walk right on by. But I remember when I received paperwork from his office about, oh, hey, we want to prosecute you. Well, here I, here I am. I'm still here. I'm a great man. But nobody wanted to say anything about that. Maybe they found out along the way that I was a great man and said, oh, shit. But it's the truth. And then I come to find out further that the courts, they don't want to hear the truth. At least not from my point of view. Because this is it. Nobody wants to hear that. Everybody's interested in prosecuting and saying, hey, he's a bad man. That's bullshit. And I'm here to say so. I hate having to stand here and say Lamont Pearson is a great man. But it's the truth. It pains me that nobody else is around to say it but me. But I've lived it. I go out every single day figuring out how I can be a better person than the last day. And that makes me feel good. I don't give a damn what anybody else says. But they're wrong. And they know it. And I know it. And they know that I know it. And I want them to know that I know it. So who speaks against me? They ask for my attention. Here I am. I am the people. I've owned my shops, my businesses. I've lived a good life. I still do every day. I am not an individual to hurt people. <laughs> Trying to label me as such. It's funny, you know, because you can look a certain way and, oh, well, that's the way he is. Or that's the way he's perceived to be. And yet, what does recent, recent history tell us? Oh, well, this guy, under the radar, all this other stuff. Boom. My hometown, second hometown, I might add. Think I haven't spent my nights up in Summerlin? <laughs> yeah, live there too. But I stand up for what's right. Always. Integrity is to do the right thing when other people aren't looking. That's what I was taught. Maybe other people have been taught different. We're good people. And it's about time, I guess, everybody needs to start knowing I'm one of them. I'm just like you. I stand up for what's right. I support what's right. Thank you, Lamont. Thank you. Hey, take care, take care of yourself as you move on with your life. <clears throat> All right. Okay, our next item is on. Uh, Board comments, uh, Supervisor Parks. <clears throat> well, we've had a um, an emotional morning, mm. um, and seeing uh, the inspiration, the moment of inspiration helps. <laughs> yes. and I, I love to be able to uh, uh, do what we can to for people to adopt. Uh, what's really becoming a pretty crowded shelter because mm -hmm. of our efforts to ensure that it remains a um, no-kill shelter. 
Uh, so I, a couple of events that I attended, and I, I wanted to uh, let the Board of Supervisors know. I know Supervisor Long and myself and uh, Mr. Powers were able to attend the ribbon cutting for Fire Station 35 in Thousand Oaks, and very long awaited and very much appreciated. This is the uh, closure then of the small fire station right along the freeway on Hillcrest, along the 101 there, to a, such a nice uh, state-of-the-art facility with architecture that really does fit into that industrial area. I know uh, we received a comment from someone who's concerned about what a fire station might look like in their neighborhood because they saw the industrial one. But the point is, is that our, our fire department does such an incredible job at making the architecture of their new fire stations fit in so well with the community, and they really did that in this case, too. I uh, also attended the uh, uh, Cabrillo Economic Development Corporation uh, annual event and heard some great stories and got a terrible case of the giggles <laughs> that I'm still recovering from. Uh, also attended uh, a, a wonderful uh, solar project ribbon cutting at Oak Park, in Oak Park at their school district of this one was at Medea Creek Middle School, and they're going to be doing that to all of their schools. And what I thought was creative, because I've, been, I've seen a lot of these uh, solar panels used, for example, in parking lots for kind of a carport effect for shading. This is actually along the blacktop next to their field where the kids play sports and basketball, and so it's, they put the bleachers under them. So you have the opportunity then to be in the shade and, uh, and even without the bleachers. It's a great idea, I thought, because the, particularly in Southern California, it gets pretty hot out there. So I, I really like that touch, but it's great to see, um, again, Oak Park School District leading the way um, in their environmentalism. And then uh, with uh, our wonderful CEO assistant, Rosa Gonzalez, I went to Thousand Oaks High School and talked to um, Dreamers, um, a lot of the students who are uh, here in the country for the, um, since, since uh, they were little, and just really encouraging them to see what they can do in their community. And it was so uh, heartening to see them come up after the speeches to say how much they want to volunteer and get involved. And I just realized now we got to make sure we can utilize them. You know, they want to be a part of the community and be involved. And we need to find the, so many great volunteer organizations for them to serve. <clears throat> And then um, I also wanted to um, mention that our senior summit, and I have some uh, brochures. As you know, the, your offices may have been getting calls already for uh, seniors who want to sign up for the senior summit. It's uh, registrations now open, so you can sign up at uh, www.seniorsummitventura.org slash senior summit. And I think in the first two days, we already had close to 200 people signed up. So this thing is going quick. And I hope that uh, everyone who wants to can attend. I encourage you to come along, the supervisors, if you'd like. And you can take a bus, free bus service from most of the senior centers, but certainly from all the cities in the county. And we thank your offices, too, for helping us coordinate it in the uh, title of this one is Seniors in the Digital Age, Don't Be a Dinosaur in a Tech-Savvy World. And we have a, a, a lot of county um, staff that will be presenting at the workshops, uh, nine separate workshops, helping to uh, learn about technology. But if you are already good with your devices and all, learning about new apps and things like that, too. So I will pass these out to you. And uh, that date is on October 21st. It's at Cal State Channel Islands, and uh, the university is also one of our sponsors. Just all this being done for free and all being done um, because of the uh, generosity of our sponsors. So very much appreciate that. And then uh, I do want to... Um, uh, mentioned that the AB 249, which was the Disclose Act, is something our Board of Supervisors supported unanimously. This requires a greater disclosure on campaign literature when you get it, so you know who really is funding it instead of these innocuous, friendly names. Um, you actually can find out where the money is behind the campaigns, and I'm so glad to see that uh, get passed, the California Clean Money Act and the campaign uh, was really uh, successful. Uh, this is 
took them about seven years to get it passed, so it was really nice to see it come forward. And then I do want to ask that the board close in honor of the people on this list, and I did mention um, both Carrie Galvin and, and Laura Ship, who were killed in Las Vegas, and um, I know Supervisor Zaragoza, when you get to your closing honor, I'd like to mention one of the people in your okay. district who closed. And that concludes we'll my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Bennett. Thank you. I'd like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of the people on this list. Uh, just want to call out to the public that uh, we have this CHIP funding, that's the Children's Health Insurance Program funding that is uh, working its way through Congress, but unfortunately they let the program expire on September 30th, uh, and they have to move fast, but uh, counties are talking about uh, identifying uh, contingency plans, but it's just unconsciousable that um, uh, Congress would have let this program uh, expire without getting it uh, reauthorized before the September 30th deadline um, to have uh, millions of children have their health insurance at risk. Um, and um, I had the pleasure of attending the Ohio Education Foundation uh, annual breakfast. Um, great event there in the Upper Ojai uh, Search and Rescue uh, fundraiser. And um, a, a thing that I'd just like to point out is as you watch these uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and all the other disasters that we have happen, um, particularly the earthquake down in uh, Mexico, which would be very similar to what we could have here, uh, there's one thing that we know for sure. The search and rescue people who are all volunteers, they're going to be there. They're going to be out there trying to find people in all of these various situations. So I think it's uh, important for us to begin to view them almost as county resources uh, in terms of what they do for us. Uh, so it was a, it was a great, uh, great event for the Ohio uh, Search and Rescue. Really appreciate their efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. So where's Long? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, it was a joy to be at the fire station and see the state of the art technology there and just is beautiful building and very happy that we're able to service that area with a great fire. I went to the uh, Mo Mobility 21, which is for a VCTC at Southern California discussing transportation and all the new things that are coming along with. Congratulations to Darren Kettle of VCTC, who is the chair. Um, along with going to the Metropolitan Water Tour in Sacramento. I want to thank Steve Blois of Cuyagas Municipal Water District for the invite. It was very insightful in, in learning about Lake Oroville, uh, Feather River Salmon Hatchery and Fish Ladder, our Sacramento uh, San Joaquin Delta, and the bank plumping plants. Uh, we were speaking yeah. about water source for Southern California, where we are and, and what might change um, also in, including in environmental issues and, and the demands for the future. So I thought it was a very good tour, very knowledge, a lot of knowledge. Uh, also went to Celebrating Manufacturing Day at Northrop Grumman down in El, in El Segundo area or Redondo Beach. Amazing that they have the F-18 um, Super Hornet um, engines and then also the Weber Space telescope that is being built. Um, not many people know that we also have employees up here in Ventura County and they're doing uh, drone technology and so forth and to make sure that we keep that employer here is extremely important for Ventura County and also with working with the Navy base. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to that. Also, um, thank you to Sheriff Dean for asking me to be the guest speaker for the Sheriff's Academy. Uh, amazing group of men and women that will be protecting and keeping us safe and want to thank them. I know throughout the hard times that we have seen, some people might not want to jump into this type of job, and I just appreciate everyone who, who is. Um, along with that, we had two town hall meetings, our Lackwood Valley and Camarillo. I wanted to say thank you to all those that attended. We had um, over 16 people at Lockwood Valley, which I thought was great, um, talking everything from code compliance, safety with brush clearing, and also uh, sheriffs with uh, safety of getting to someone's home, um, also with uh, internet 
and um, the phone service there when you're out of range and so forth, those were key issues. Um, also came to the local 150 Carpenters Union Skilled Competition Barbecue. An amazing set of skilled workers there that are learning, that are um, competing everything from sawing a four by four, nailing five nails as quickly as possible and so forth. Very competitive, but I appreciate that that union is teaching a skill set to these carpenters so that they can take that to the next level and for economy. Um, we received a nice call from constituent praising uh, Dina Ontoveris from our aging agency on area agency on aging for the great job that she does on fall prevention. Want to thank kudos to that. Also, the senior summit. We are getting calls at our office, Supervisor Park. So um, we are pushing them towards you and making sure mm -hmm. they get get the information they need. We also have a symposium on October 14th. Uh, please save the date. It is this Saturday. Empower Yourself. It's our eighth annual breast symposium. It's sponsored by St. John's Integrated Breast Center, and it's at the Sarah Center from 8.30 to 2 p.m. If you know anyone who has hit um, the news of breast cancer, it, it's, very, it's a very sad uh, illness, but if you can come here, we can teach you some other things that are going on. Um, and that can help you on your day to day. Also, legislation. There is so much to cover. Um, I'd love to, on a state level, over 700 bills. Uh, there's new press releases every day with more and more bills that are going on. So you can go to gov.ca.gov, gov, under press releases to see what Governor Brown is doing on a daily basis. Um, and to make sure that you know from our county level, <coughs> Um, we are more engaged than ever on state and federal issues, just like uh, um, Supervisor Bennett was talking about with the chip and the salt. Um, I appreciate the um, lobbyists that we have to make sure that on a daily basis that our um, governing bodies know what, what we need for Ventura County. So along with that, I will adjourn with a memory on this list. It almost seems Thank like you. we had a record number of bills in this at the state, doesn't it? Yes. That's right. And I already got calls for November of what what do we need for Ventura County. So Thank you so much, Supervisor Foy. I think there's some people in Sacramento a little bored looking for things to do. <laughs> looking for work. It's amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I bet you that's a great read going on that. <laughs> 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 wow. Um, just really, and you know, you did a good job at the uh, academy. It was great, and so congratulations on that. They had a lot of people there. It was it was a great group of uh, officers and from all over the place. So it was it was really good. Um, anyway, also uh, again, I don't want to uh, forget about Susan Smith, uh, 53 of Simi Valley. Again, that was part of the Las Vegas situation. She was an avid uh, country music fan and very popular at Vista Elementary, and so. Uh, she worked there three years, so we don't want to let that go by. And then, but talking about education, uh, the Peach Hill Academy over in uh, Moore Park, one of the top 25 Blue Ribbon schools, just great education going on in uh, Ventura County. And I want to adjourn the memory of people on this list. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Okay, I have several items I'd like to share too. On Wednesday, the September 27, I attended at the Oxnard Fire Department uh, Pink Campaign kickoff at BJ's Restaurant in Oxnard, and, and Supervisor, that's regarding. Uh, the breast cancer too, you know, so they were very instrumental in raising money for breast cancer. Additionally, on uh, the 29th, I attended the Oxnard Chamber of Commerce 29th Military Appreciation Dinner Ceremony. And Paul Grossman was there representing you and did a, an excellent job. We had Thank quite you. a few individuals there. Additionally, on, on, the tw on the 30th, we had a Ventura County Public Health 9th Annual La Colonia Community 5K Walk. And uh, there was quite a few people there, maybe a couple hundred people. In fact, my daughter was here from Fort Worth, and she likes to run, so she ran the 5K, too, with them. It was, it was great. Also, you know, I attended the Port of Wanimi 6th Annual Banana Festival. Several thousand, my understanding was there's about 12,000 people there, and it was just great. You know, we, uh, I attended again. Paul, your chief of staff, was there with me. Great, really great representation for you. And my understanding is that, um, let me back up a little bit. We all, they also celebrated the 80th 
anniversary of, of, of the Port of Wainimi. And also we honored the daughter of Richard Bard, the father of Wainimi Harbor. And uh, she's going to be 100 years old here, uh, what, next month? Mm -hmm. About 100 years old. So that was, uh, and of course, you know, the granddaughter of Thomas Bard, the builder of the Wainimi Wharf. And additionally, I attended the Ventura County Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission Annual Award. That's a hard to say. Ceremony. And that uh, was attended by my staff member, Lourdes, and myself. And we gave certificates to all the recipients. They're really doing an excellent job, you know, for, for Ventura County. Also then, last week, I attended the 22nd Annual Multicultural Festival in Oxnard Plaza Park. Another several thousand people there that, uh, that we attended. It was a great event. Lots of family and children attended the ceremonies, and it was just a great event. And I'd just like to share again, like I share all the time, I don't care where I go, Mike, our staff are there. Health. Every single, I don't care what it is, <clears throat> there. we have our, whether it's health or it's probation, whether, you know, they're there, you know, which I think is good representation, too. And also last night, we had a special meeting at our MAC for El Rio Island Acres regarding an our ADU, our second unit, you know, that, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Trisha Myers, Jennifer, and Owens from the planning uh, department. They did an excellent job presenting, you know, that uh, ADU concept to, to the people in El Rio and Nyland Acres. In addition, I'd like to call out, um, I'd like to adjourn in memory of those folks, and I'd like to call out um, Manny Perez. Manny was 90 years old, just passed on. Uh, a couple of days ago, and he was a retired assistant fire chief for the city of Oxnard. He was very active in Oxnard Sister City Committee and was very instrumental in helping the Oklahoma Fire Department, where they actually received two old fire trucks, you know, from the city of Oxnard. They actually flew them in a C-130 to, to Mexico. He was a former planning commissioner for the city of Oxnard. He served in the Ventura County Grand Jury. He served in the U.S. Navy, was married to Virginia for 68 years and they raised three children in South Oxnard. And he's second generation Mexican, <laughs> what's that? She's got, she's got a, lot of years to go. <laughs> a lot of years to go and see that. He's second generation Mexican American. He was once asked about segregation in, in, in South Oxnard. And Manuel's response was, I don't believe that that's too much. I believe it's how you feel, is what he said. I don't believe in that too much. I don't feel that's the way to go. He said, you're not governed by where you come from. It's what you do that counts, is what he said. Chief Perez, again, was an example of a good guy. He was also one of those persons that trained quite a, a, a few firefighters in Oxnard. And my understanding, Bill Gallagher worked for me. He was one of his students, and he said they used to get angry at him. But he says, one of these days, I'm going to save your life. So he was that type of guy. So I'd like to honor him in that. And also we have uh, Mr. Martin Kaplan. You know, he was a uh, 77-year-old, uh, passed away uh, October the 5th in the comfort of his home. And Marty was active and a volunteer in the Ventura County a a Agency and Aging Commission. And he is really going to miss, according to, to his peers. And my condolences go out to his family, and I understand to Wizard Parks that uh, you wanted to share something about him, too. I don't know if, if we sent a photo over, but it was just a, I, I love the photo that um, Victoria Jump sent of Marty Kaplan, Dr. Kaplan, and uh, it has him uh, at the Area Agency on Aging receiving um, proclamations and all that. But just a, such a special man, not only serving the county on the Area Agency on Aging, he also started the OSHA program with the, um, at Cal State University Channel Islands, which is the lifelong learning institute there for seniors who want to go back and, and have a rich education. He also was a member of the board of the New West Symphony and also on caregivers. And it, I was at his funeral yesterday and just um, learned so much about him. You know, sometimes it takes something like that, but it was just so impressive as a... Uh, a professor, how he has, um, you know, really mentored so many other professors and, you know, overseeing their dissertations and, and also just the wonderful stories from his family. Um, started off as a 
a son of uh, uh, his father was a truck driver in Brooklyn and his mom a housewife and not, neither of them had any college education and for him to really excel kind of what you're saying you know we are given the abilities to do these things mm. and he decided to go as I uh, graduated high school in two years and went on um, all the way to get his uh, doctorate. So I uh, know he will be very much missed. Um, we um, uh, really gained from what he gave to our county, and I just want to make sure that we do, uh, as you will, close in mm -hmm. honor of his memory. Thank and, you. And all the best to his family and, and Lydia Kaplan, his wife. And I understand children. that he, he was a genius. You know, he was pretty smart. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, you know, yeah. to be able to do what he has yeah. done and um, just a, a very remarkable man and also a very humble. Yeah, One of the words that came out in the memorial was how he was shy. And you think, yeah, he was. And yet <laughs> so accomplished, you know, okay. and, and so much of that is because of his caring for others. So very remarkable man, very much missed. Thank you. Michael? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Zaragoza, board members, and, and thank you, Chair Zaragoza, for recognizing the, the, our county family that's out in the community. Because it, 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 we know how much you all are out in the community, and they are out there nights, weekends, you name it. They see that as part of their responsibility to engage and listen to the community. And so, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> On uh, this Thursday, we have the Ventura County Public Leadership Discussion on Broadband Opportunities and Challenges. This is part of uh, our county's overall effort to support the economy here through our economic vitality plan. And uh, it's going to be in partnership with the EDCVC. That's October 12th, this Thursday at 8.30 at VCCF. And we'll have experts talking about, uh, like in Kansas City, talking about how being a gig city has improved their economic competitiveness. Mm -hmm. The introduction of Internet of Things and sensor-driven world and innovations for providing high-speed network and communication solutions for business. And this is, a, I think it's a real game changer for our local economy because it helps small business but also helps uh, low-income folks make sure everyone has access to high-speed internet in our community. So uh, really an exciting time and I appreciate everybody banding together to, banding together, I didn't mean that, uh, to, to help with this. I uh, wanted to let you know too that on October 2nd, uh, Catherine Rodriguez and Rosa Gonzalez and I presented at the request of uh, Stan Mantooth to the Ventura Co County Office of Education, their uh, leadership team there, uh, Dr. Castro and his team, just on, on leadership issues and Q&A on, on Ventura County and how we do things here. So uh, appreciated that and partnerships with our Office of Education. Also, the Management Council put on, uh, I thought it was a really good, uh, it was a panel, uh, it had, uh, on leadership, had uh, Chief uh, Mark Varela, uh, Chief uh, Mark Lorenzen, uh, Victoria Jump, uh, Johnson Gill, and, uh, and I just appreciate uh, Management Council putting it on, uh, and Betsy Hunt Swanson Hollinger, our training department director, and the training department is just really doing great, great things, and uh, she led it, she moderated it, and uh, we seem to be getting uh, good feedback on it and appreciate them uh, coming together because it's all about growth and development of our leadership team here at the county and it takes time and energy to do it and to do it right and, and they did it right. Uh, and then lastly, just let you know on the uh, Greenbelt graduation. This was our 25th Greenbelt graduation. Really appreciate the department heads uh, mm -hmm. coming out and everybody's busy, but uh, Paul Stamper, uh, and Rachel did a great job of putting it on, as they always do, because they, they present the certificates, but they also have about three presentations, and they're pretty quick, mm. and they get to a really important area uh, that folks uh, need to address, and they talk about how they, how they resolved it. And that's, what, that's the stuff that happens that people don't see every day, the taxpaying public doesn't see, but we wish they would know more about, because it's that hard work, sort of nose to the grindstone, trying to do it better, uh, and that's a great example of it. And uh, I commend them for uh, both the trainers and the people going through the graduation, and we also had our second... Uh, our second uh, wave of uh, project management. So there's a separate program called Project Leadership, uh, Project Management Leadership, and we had the second graduation for that too. Also great uh, trainers in that program because, uh, as we say at the time, Ventura County doesn't do anything small. We only have big project, complex projects. There's no easy, easy ones, and they're all different. And uh, so there's a lot of expertise in this county, and I love that they're sharing, uh, these, these uh, trainers are sharing their knowledge uh, broadly uh, with all of our county managers. So that's it. Thank you. And again, you know, I just want to share with you, people don't understand, you know, all the workers that are really doing the excellent work for us, and we mm -hmm. convey the message, but they're the ones that do all the work, you know. So, right. I, think so. Um, I just wanted to just say one thing and to say thank you. I wasn't quite aware of how many people actually watch this, uh, our meetings because there's not as many people here out in the Dyson. But um, I was amazed that on Frontier, Channel 3, 1 o'clock, they're talking about our board presentation on water. 
and you go on our online and so forth. So I just want to say thank you to our carriers and to everyone for making sure that they know what's going on in the county. And um, I appreciate that our constituents are actually paying attention and making sure they, they are informed. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. It reminds me that uh, when I first came on the Board of Supervisors, none of the board meetings were available to be watched on television by any anywhere. And so we started off by just taking the DVD over to City Hall and having them put it on. Now we can do that electronically, and I think it's pretty much carried in most of the districts. So that's, it's good to see people have the ability to find out what county government's all about. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Okay, our next item, item 32, uh, Brian. And this HSA and Barry Zimmerman. Approval and authorization for Human Services Agency Director to sign and submit a non competitive grant application to California Department of Social Services to fund housing and right. take it. Good morning, Zer, uh, Chair Zaragoza, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, for the record, I'm Barry Zimmerman with the Human Services Agency. And that is correct. What's before you is a submission of an application for a housing and disability income advocacy program. It, this is a non-competitive, and let me explain that a little bit. This is a non-competitive uh, grant, but we have to apply for it to achieve it. The state has received and set up the program and allocated so much to each county. And uh, if, if we apply, we'll become eligible to receive those funds. If we don't apply for it, those funds will be reverted back to the state and reallocated to other counties. And there's no guarantee in the second and third year of the process that we will have access to these funds. It's a great opportunity here. It is a matched funds between uh, one to one dollar uh, for, for the funding. It's a $495,000 allocation, which we match over the three-year period there. The proposal is to serve about 92 individuals, and these are individuals who are disabled. And this provides a gap in our current system right now where uh, individuals that are homeless, that are disabled, have to go through an application process to qualify for disability payments, whether it's veterans' disabilities, Social Security disability, or whatever it may be. Oftentimes, we struggle in getting those individuals connected with those disability payments because we cannot stabilize them because they're unsheltered. And so this, this program is actually designed to provide bridge housing to allow us to take an individual who otherwise would be on their own trying to make it through the process. We would stabilize them, then case manage them through their disability. Uh, application process. It is important to secure that because that is a primary income source then that we use in other programs like in the rapid rehousing programs and so forth to stably house them in the long-term situations there. So this fit, fits a great need for us over this uh, period of time. It's a three-year grant. We will have a dedicated caseworker to do that. Uh, they will be doing outreach act activities as well as disability advocacy activities and case managing these individuals in that long-term housing. So in a nutshell, that's uh, the, the program. We have looked at other areas throughout for the match, um, trying to leverage other fundings, but we have coordinated with whole person is, a, is an avenue that we will be working with as well as with AAA and other individuals that come across it, it, homeless individuals that may be disabled. So that's where we're at today. Any yeah. questions? So there's a point. Mm -hmm. Barry, um, yes. it's always expensive to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, but tell me, you told us what the program does. Yes. Tell us about the success of this program or what, what do you expect? This success? is a brand new uh, program. Our success is that uh, just based on historical that yes. we've, we've housed individuals in our HPRP program. We're about a 70% success rate in housing an individual and then maintaining that home on their own for six months afterwards is our measurement period. Right. So we have about a 70, 75% success so, so part of this is to get them in, get them into stable, and I guess that's what I'm asking because I've heard that you've been pretty successful with this. Yes. A lot of these programs aren't this successful. The idea that you measure for at least the six months after they've been able to stay in, they've been able to pay, they've been able to stabilize their lives and is what this program is is doing. Do we have any idea where they're at after six, or do you guys have any? No, we uh, we don't know. We do know that, uh, you know, um, 
we, we often don't see them return back to us, so, so we assume. So okay. most of the programs in our six months is the federal requirement, and that's all we, we have uh, resources to track them during that time period. So we don't see a lot of recidivism occurring on on those that, that we place, and so okay. well, which which is then successful itself, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So so this will also be a beneficial to us. The majority of these uh, individuals that we'll be targeting will be on general relief, and so part of this is that uh, as we work them to stabilize them and apply for disability. The, the disability payment will go back and reimburse the county for the period of time in which we had them on general relief program. So it is not only a benefit to the individual, but it does it aid our general relief program as well. Great. Thanks. Michael? Yeah, I would just echo and, and thank HSA because I think you're really targeting in on a, on a gap that we had, but also with a proven program. I thought the HPRP program was more of a short-term fix. Mm -hmm. But it turns out, as Barry said, at 70 to 80 percent effective people get, once they sustain, they get on a good path and they can stay sustained there, uh, successfully housed on into the yeah. future. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the reasons we're supporting a general fund contribution to it because it's, it's, it's effective and it's targeting a need of the, of the disabled folks uh, to make sure we get them connected uh, and then tie it into our continuum of care efforts as well. So, so Major Parks and then Long. Mm -hmm. um, Physical disabilities or also mental disabilities? Yeah, it's anything that, that would meet the classification of di disability, which m mental illness does, does meet a criteria. Because I think that uh, oftentimes it is that disability that has people becoming homeless. Exactly. And to be That's able right. to get a roof over their head to help them with that disability, if that is something that we can do also, can actually really help to move them forward into permanent housing where they can become in more independent. Absolutely. So where's it long? Um, my comment is I just appreciate the data driven on this. Um, when I do the math for 92 individuals with over 991,000, that's roughly around 10,000 plus dollars per person sure. that we're doing on this program. And um, I appreciate you hitting on the point that our effectiveness is at a 70% or more, I think that's really important so that we are doing preventative versus later on and it's much more costly. It saves um, money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think 10000 is a lot, but when I see it in the big picture, I do appreciate everyone's um, focus on this to make sure that we can get them home. So thank you. So there's a benefit. I just want to emphasize how, uh, how needed this program is and it's so essential that part of the county mission certainly is helping people who can't help themselves and to focus on the disabled like this uh, and this is a population that we have a hole in in terms of, of really serving them uh, I really appreciate the efforts yeah, to go after absolutely. this thank you very much thank you and Barry like I said you know if even if it costs ten thousand dollars per it's going to save us maybe twenty thousand dollars in the future and prevent them you know applications Absolutely. So thank you. All and right. we get a <laughs> high value. <laughs> <laughs> we got a motion and a, we need a second. Thank you, brother. Please vote. Right, thank you. Thank you. Our next item is item 33, and this is CEO's office approval of County of Ventura Flexible Benefits Program and Health Benefit Rates and contract providers for plan year 2018. <laughs> Good morning, Chair okay, Zaragoza, Supervisors, Mr. Mm -hmm. Powers. Uh, it's my pleasure today to be in front of you to recommend the 2018 medical dental vision plans as well as the premium rate uh, changes for the 2018 year. Um, it, so, to go into the, there's no plan design changes that we recommend for the 2018 year for any of the plans other than for the Anthem plan in which there is a pharmacy benefit management change that was uh, um, approved by the Joint Powers Authority that the Anthem plan is, is a part of. We anticipate minimum disruption and it will produce savings. So other than that, there's, there are no plan design changes. In regard to premium um, changes which are in involve increases and decreases for the health plan, uh, we recommend those be, um, those be approved by you. Uh, as always, the VCHCP plan provides affordable, comprehensive, and effective health care for the vast majority of our employees. The actuarial rate increase for the VCHCP is 
9.5%. The Anthem increase is 9%, but keep in mind, please, that the Anthem plans, while they're good plans, they do offer their services at a higher price point. Um, the thing that I want to remind you of is that, is that in 2016, for the 2017 plan year, you approved a transition from composite rates to pre, uh, tiered rates uh, over a number of years, which we anticipate w it will take. So this year, as in last year, the rates are tiered as opposed to in prior years, it, it was always composite. So with tiered rates, we anticipate that employee and employee, uh, employee plus one rates will, in the next few years as we transition to fully actuarial rates, they will either decrease, as you see in, in the Anthem plans, or increase at a much less significant rates, rate than the family, family rate. So by way of example, in the Anthem plan EPO, uh, we see employee-only rates decrease by 6.5%, whereas family rates are increasing by 12.4%. And that's just reflective of the unsubsidization that's occurring throughout these, these years, if that makes sense. One thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, we're very fortunate that uh, employees who are represented by uh, unions which, went into, uh, which uh, entered into an MOA with the county and for non-represented employees. Um, you may recall that your board approved and the unions ratified a $50 per pay period increase in the flexible credit allowance. So the uh, effect of the premium increases that I bring before you today is mitigated by the $50 uh, allowance increases that we anticipate to go into place January 1 or the beginning of the plan year. So the $50 credit increase actually offsets for all VCHCP members any out of, uh, it offsets any premium increases. So most people will get actually more money in their pockets. And for the family members, it'll be almost a break even. For Anthem, which is a far lower number, the family, uh, those employees who have family membership Will, will be the only ones that see actually increased out of pocket. So there's about 395 of those em employees out of the total population of 6,000 uh, 6, plus, plus members. In regard to those employees who elect not to participate in the county sponsored plans and have their flexible credit allowance reduced by what, what we call the opt out, uh, medical opt out fee. Um, that rate is, is calculated via, via an actuarial methodology that was, I think, has been in effect since at least 1999. And your, your board essentially approved uh, the opt-out fee in as far back as 1992. That increase will go up by 9.8%, which is pegged to the premium increases. It's about a $23 increase. So um, even those people will actually see more, more uh, money in their pockets because they're getting the $50 flex flex credit allowance increase. Um, now, obviously, there are so some... So the opt-out people get the, the benefit also? The opt-out? Yes. The, oh, okay. uh, everyone gets the... For all those employees that are covered by MOAs and mm -hmm. non-represented employees that were just recently approved, and there are some that are not covered um, because we haven't, we haven't entered into negotiations mm -hmm. with them yet. For all those employees, the flex credit allowance is actually more than any opt-out increase or increase in premium It's a good benefit premium then. rates. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was, a, it was a very generous benefit uh, mm -hmm. that, we, that you approved uh, for mm -hmm. these MOAs. Um, the opt-out fee actually then is put into the county-sponsored health plans and serves to offset premium increases uh, to the tune of about 10.5%. Uh, of the premiums are uh, offset by uh, opt-out fees. So it does go back as I think the intention of the flexible credit allowance essentially is to fund the, fund the um, county-sponsored health plans. With regard to the dental and vision plans, I'm pleased to announce that for, the, for both plans, we're in, in a second year of three-year negotiated contracts with MetLife and um, MES. The dental increase is 3.6%, which actually reflects the Affordable Care Act reinstatement of some of those taxes. And for MES, we have a rate pass. So I think that's relatively good news for, for those plans. 
Um, again, I want to thank you, uh, Board and Mr. Powers, for your leadership. In this county, we're fortunate to have um, the opportunity to, to have affordable and comprehensive health plans to provide to our employees. So I thank you for your leadership. And with that, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sean. Any questions of Sean? I just wanted to note, you have a committee that also looks at this, correct? Uh, my apologies. I should have mentioned that. It's in the letter. A joint labor management committee. Um, okay. We meet approximately seven times a year. All the unions uh, um, participate or are free to participate, and we encourage their input. And certainly a few days before, uh, before this board date, we did uh, brief them on the, on the, the non-plan design changes and the rate increases. So... Uh, we ask them for their input and welcome it throughout the year. And they, they have had the opportunity to review what's before you. Thank you. I Thank just you. want to make sure that we are mm -hmm. in good communication with everybody and getting people's feedback um, because I know changes, no one likes change. And so <laughs> just making sure everyone is incorporated. So thank you very much for the efforts. So thank is that you. a motion? Yes. That is a motion. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Turned into a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Please vote. Okay, that's approved. And Michael, going to just thank you to Sean. Sean and Tracy and Ken and Brian upstairs for crunching all these numbers. There's a lot of actuarial analysis that goes into this this one day here and this one set of rates. So good job. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Oh, I thought Sean did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Item 34, Supervisor Parks. She saved it to the end. <laughs> Thirty-four. Yeah, I'm also. Mm -hmm. uh, I would ask that the board appoint the uh, Mr. Bianchi again, reappoint, and Mr. Scarin to the Waterworks District Number Thirty-Eight, uh, and that's the Lake Sherwood one. Okay. We got a first and a second. Please vote. And that's approved. And we'll take thirty-five. Supervisor Bennett and Parks. Th th thank you very much. This is a. Uh, relatively small change in our procedural things at our last uh, planning commission hearing uh, because of our policy they divided the speakers between those in favor and those opposed and all the speakers in favor uh, spoke first and they went all the way until lunchtime then they broke for an hour for lunch and then they so people that got there at nine o'clock in the morning at the planning commission hearing um, some of them very early uh, didn't speak and so in, in looking into it um, some people brought that up and looking into it found out that it's our, our county policy that, that does that um, doesn't feel didn't didn't create a sense of a feeling of fairness um, that people that got there uh, and so um, like to uh, Supervisor Parks and I have this uh, letter suggesting that we should change the policy to do what we do here in the boardroom, which is we take the hearing uh, based on who submits their card first. Uh, and that way you can hear from both people in favor of and opposed, but you're not showing any kind of institutional bias one way or the other uh, in terms of speakers. It's certainly hard for some people uh, to be able to stay from 9 o'clock in the morning until 2 or 3 in the afternoon uh, for a hearing like that. So um, I'd like okay. to uh, turn it over to Supervisor Parks and see if you mm -hmm. have anything you want to add. Uh, I know when I first came on the board and when I first was chair of the Board of Supervisors and uh, the clerk of the board at the time had separated the cards into pro and con speakers on a hearing um, the, you know, that whole concept is actually written in policy in our, um, our manual. So to me, that is an unfair way of presenting it because the public doesn't have um, the ability to, you know, come and speak um, um, when they submit their card. And so if you have all the pros go first, um, as you were saying, the people who are con, for example, have to wait till the very end. And if there are a lot of speakers that can take... Uh, it could even take more than a day <laughs> if you have to come back again. So uh, it, it makes a lot more sense um, to have it be, you know, first come, first cards in. That would be the first ones that we call, and that's how we do public comments. And, and that's the way I do it now. You know, it, 
Brian gives them as they come in. That's I read them. We, I don't separate them at all. You know, just I read them as they as they come in. And, and there are times when we have like a mayor in the audience that will let them go okay. first or something yes. like that. But in general, I think this would be a better policy to just have as they come in or the, how you call them when you're the chair. That's right. And I have a speaker on this item, uh, uh, Sean Peroski. Peroski. Hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yes, Porosky. Thank you, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Chairman Zaragoza. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to um, come and take a moment uh, to talk about this uh, change. Uh, having been to a number of Planning Commission meetings, I absolutely sympathize with uh, the time and energy required to sit through long, long hearings where a lot of people are testifying. Uh, and I think it's totally fair to um, have a first-come, first-serve basis like we do here at the Board uh, because it, it rewards people who take the initiative to show up early um, and to show up on time and to turn in their speaker cards. I think it's absolutely great policy. Uh, one other recommendation I would make uh, while we're here uh, looking at changing policies for the Planning Commission, um, you'll notice that I was given a uh, time limit uh, here uh, to speak here in front of the board. I think extending that same policy to the Planning Commission would do a lot to helping respect people's time who come to the Planning Commission uh, and to make it easier for more people to come and speak on these topics. Because if you have 100 people coming and talking on a topic and each of them takes 10 minutes to talk, that's a lot of time to invest for people to come, especially people who you know, work part-time jobs, several part-time jobs, to come and take time out of their day uh, and testify on this subject. So while we're here talking about changes, I, I would recommend that the board um, require the a planning commission to set a time limit for speakers uh, to res respect people's time. And normally, normally it's up to the chair, you know, to set the time. If they have a lot of speakers, they could go maybe a couple of minutes or sure. three minutes. And if not, maybe the five minutes, but uh, maybe uh, the supervisor uh, can recommend that. A, a couple of things. And one, I agree with Mr. Porowski. I've heard that from lots of people that they just, they don't put any time limit on and it just uh, goes on and on and on. A suggestion that I have is that if the planning commissioners want to hear more from somebody that they have that person take their time like if they give everybody three minutes or five minutes and then if they have more that they want that they have to do it after everybody else they, mm -hmm. they can come back for a second by the app if the planning commissioners want to do that but my question for county council is could we make that modification in our policy today or is that something we'd have to notice um, separately Well, I, I think it's generally in the scope of the policy, so I think if you want to debate it, you can add that. Well, could we do this? Cause I, what I don't want to do is wordsmith this. Mm -hmm. I would like to just add it as also a, uh, a, a direction from the board to the Planning Commission that we would like them to institute some Good kind time. of time uh, time limits and not get into the details or the wordsmithing of that. So put time limits. That'd be great idea put time surprise. limits Thank with you. board with with chair discretion, like the chair. Yeah. So right. if it's too, but that Can, but that they institute some right. kind of time limits. Right. Yeah. Uh, John, John, do you have any more cards? Uh, no, that's the last I, one. I didn't have a lot of chance to talk, with, but I see my planning commissioner out here. Could I ask her to come up, if I would, just to, just for a point of reference? Sure. <laughs> put She's going to be up on the next of the thing anyway. You want to put her on the spot? I'm going to put her on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since I, I tried to get a hold of her yesterday to ask this question, but she told me she's at a spot, so I couldn't get her. Good morning. Um, thank you, Peter, for putting me on the spot. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just share a perspective. Can, can you with, share your name? I'm oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Maggie Kessley, and I live in Simi Valley, and I'm okay. currently serving on the Planning Commission. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would just like to share a perspective. Um, it has been my understanding that it is at the Chair's discretion as to how the process works, mm -hmm. and many times it's been very helpful to hear um, uh, the approved, you know, the uh, those that are uh, um, uh, for something and those that are opposed in, mm -hmm. in separate entities so that when we're hearing it, we're hearing testimony that's on one part and testimony that's on the other part. Many times um, at the discretion of the chair, if there is somebody in the audience that even though public hearing has been closed and the chair has that discretion, they have the ability to say, you know what, let's, let's hear from you. We know you have something to say. So it really has been helpful to, let, to leave that to the discretion of the chair, and I'm wondering if you take that away, if you um, remove that flexibility, um, because the appellant has many times had an opportunity to speak even after we have closed the hearing. We really never had a problem until the meeting of September 8th where we had 
more speakers than I've ever seen. And what did happen, and maybe this is a, co a good compromise, anybody that comes after the meeting starts, those are the cards that should be um, heard um, in the order that they come. The people that get there before a hearing, maybe you hear those, the, the, those that are for and those that are against, and then open it up to um, as they come, anybody that comes after that. Just a, just a. So Maggie, the, the concern is that, uh, is it timed when the, the uh, speakers come up, they have so many minutes or they don't? So that again is at the discretion of the chair, and I will tell you for me, it would be helpful to have a time limit on That's speakers, right. absolutely, and then yeah. maybe ask them to come up and if there's something more to say. And it's only fair to the rest of the people, some people maybe have a time limit, you know, and, and they have to go back to work or whatever, but. Uh, yes. I'm supervisor, I'm not sure what uh... Well, I, uh, so I, I appreciate your comments. Um, uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you agree about the time limits. That is something that I've heard for quite some time about the Planning Commission. Um, so I'm certainly there for the time limits. And I appreciate that you may, that the Planning Commissioners may find it helpful to have these clumped together, I, I guess because of consistency of testimony or something. But yeah. the, I, I, I just think that I, I feel strongly that the sense of fairness that is, is what's really important. People have to feel like it's fair. And if, if you're sitting there and you hear 25 or 30 people uh, speaking all, you know, in favor of, I, I don't care whose side it is that's, right. that's going first, the other side feels disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And I think that if I had to weigh one side feeling it's disadvantaged or fair, versus the convenience of the planning commissioners because of having the testimony come together. I don't think there's any question in my mind I'd stick with transparency mm -hmm. uh, and, and a sense of fairness that it's it, that we haven't we haven't rigged this one way or the other. I would also point out just the other thing that there have been a number of people that have wanted to comment and they go, you know, my comment isn't in favor of or opposed. It's I got I got things mm -hmm. I want to say on both sides of this issue, mm -hmm. and 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 so we're artificially characterizing some people, you know, uh, in in the, in that environment also. So um, I, I would still stick with the motion with the added addition about uh, um, directing the planning commission to come up with some kind so of. So Long and then Parks. Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you very much for speaking. Do we still need back? Of your position, we still um, I, I, I don't think so. So, if you want to go sit down, you, want you can. Uh, I'm um, sorry. Did you have any other anything comments? else? Respond to oh Steve no, I just wanted to say Thank I you. don't disagree at all with it, um, with the policy. I just would maybe um, ask that you leave it still up to the discretion, or uh, give the chair still some discretionary time, yeah. um, ability in case they want to have somebody come back up and speak. Well, and I appreciate that because I believe yeah. that it is at the discretionary of the chair. Yeah. Yeah. To to be able to um, listen and and direct and set the and timing so, mm -hmm. and set the time yeah. and so in the in this resolution there is a um, point in which there still leaves discretion for the chair and this is both on the planning commission and the board of supervisors and here at the board of supervisors we do it's the first come first serve That's now right. we we don't allow people just to drop a chunk of cards to do a time savings. Um, which I, I appreciate, but I, I do think it, it helps to hear both sides That's right. um, and also certain comments. Now, if you hear your your side say no, you could just say they already spoke to me and so forth. So I'm okay with that. I just wanted to make sure that we're not taking um, something that for discretionary of the chair, depending on the moment. Now, I do understand that the chair, the last three chairs, did this process of heard the pros and then the cons. That's so it's, it's, it's been a long standing that this is the process of the commission. And I understand this one day there was a little bit more um, discussion on this Confusion. Fact. Confusion <laughs> and so forth. I heard it in my office many times. Yeah. And so we were looking at doing this too. So I applaud that this is being brought up right now. Um, I just wanted to make sure, and we spoke with the chair and also the planning commission from our office to make sure that they were... Um, that this would be good and that there wasn't any further demands on the clerk of the boards in doing this process. And I believe okay. that it works quite well. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people knew about that. Well, thank you for sharing. And I the supervisor put you on the spot. You did a good job. <laughs> thank you very much. Supervisor Parks. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to move forward with the policy that we're requesting. And we talk about when you do lump 
all the pros together and all the cons together, it can give the impression, particularly if there's a lot more of one than the other, that it is, uh, Supervisor Bennett used the word rig, but you just feel like it is loaded to one side. Mm -hmm. But what I also like about the, you know, splitting it in between uh, as you go through one of each is that you have the opportunity to have some dialogue and not just reading your speech, but you can also react to what you just heard. And I think that furthers the... Um, the information that the commission or the board would receive. Um, as to um, how the planning commission should change the amount of time that they allocate for their speakers, um, I would uh, ask that the planning commission actually have that discussion and bring it back to us if they do want to make changes to that. Um, but I, I, I feel a little bit hesitant without being able to discuss, for example, with my planning commissioner, you know, what do they think about the idea of um, tightening the time? Mm. One nice thing is, uh, while it is um, excruciating long sometimes, <laughs> and a lot of that also isn't just the public comment, but also, you know, the, the commission itself, n nothing personal, but it does take a long time for those meetings. It has the effect of really... Um, getting everything out there, really vetting things. And I think people feel like they are being heard. And I, I do appreciate that a lot. I think, um, you know, having that ability to, you know, express all the things that you feel need to be considered before you make that vote is important. So I'm, I'm not ready at this time to start directing mm -hmm. or um, telling the planning commission how they should do their meetings. Uh, but I would be very much supportive of having the Planning Commission have that discussion. One recommendation is if you have pros and cons and they're divided, there's always, you know, the, the person that's pro that speaks last and then and the con, mm -hmm. and that would probably satisfy mm -hmm. you. But there's, so there's two issues. One one is the policy before us. The other is this new suggestion of mm -hmm. limiting the amount of time at the Planning Commission. And I would just ask that that limitation on time be something that the Planning Commission consider and make a recommendation uh, what so they would like to I, I just I, I, I appreciate your thoughts. I just think that that, that that almost feels overly cumbersome. All we're doing is we're saying we're asking the Planning Commission to set some time limits. Sometime. But we're giving them lots of discretion in terms of how they do right. that, et cetera. Right. So let them let them figure, figure it out. It out. But, but we're, we're sending a message that we're hearing from a lot of people, um, time. Uh, you know, that the time limits would be helpful hearing from even one planning commissioner. So I think we're, we're directing them to set some kind of time limits. And if they want to hear, make sure that somebody hears everything, then they can go, for example, everybody gets five minutes, and if you need to go over five minutes after we're done with everybody, you can come, come back, back up and, and make sure that you make it comprehensive. So that's all the motion does is direct them to set some time limits, but it doesn't give them the, the option of saying we're not going to do let them figure out the rest of the so. procedure. That's right. Well, and, and let me just ask one other thing. If you're going to these commissions and you're trying to read the information, the information comes the day of the night before. Our employees are reading them midnight. They're still going on. If there's any other way, if we're looking at processes to better improve, if there's a way, just like with the Board of Supervisors, we try to get that type of information in, um, I, her head out I would that, love yes. to see that. Because that is something that I hear from so many people, yeah. either on the pro side or the con side. That's true. We need the information in so that we can have good discussions. And so I would. I apologize, but no, I don't. Um, I don't apologize for that. Um, I would like to see that also looked into. So if we can direct the uh, planning commission to look into how to better manage that, and to maybe set uh, 24 hours or something or some information so we can be more ready for those meetings, I would appreciate that. And, and our clerk does a really good job for us here. You know, they, we have our agendas are. Yes, are, are, and, and that's why I'm asking for them as well. We'd want to give them those kudos there. That, that happens here also. And I think that we also have been able to say, this is new information. We need to read it and study it. Let's put this and continue it. And, and we always have that ability when you get um, a huge amount of information and it's, you just don't, can't possibly digest it and have a hearing at the exact same time. But so so that's good. why they, we need to help them. So that they can say that. And Brian's pretty good about you know giving us so information. I, I'm, I'm comfortable yeah. adding adding to the motion. Then besides the time limit, we ask the planning staff to work with the planning commission mm -hmm. to to make all reasonable efforts to make sure there's a, 
advance notice, uh, enough advance notice that people have time to read the agenda. Item. Okay, we've got a first, a second. Uh, Let's see. Is that, that did I capture? We yes. okay. What's what you were saying? Yes, that's okay. reasonable. Okay. okay. If you got a, we read please the motion. Vote. Please sure. read the motion. It's to approve the recommendations and to direct the Planning Commission to implement time limits for public speakers at the Chair's discretion and direct planning staff to work with the Planning Commission to establish procedures to receive and distribute the information for agenda items in advance of the meeting. In addition to the recommended actions that we have. In addition Correct. to. Long, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Please vote. Now they're going to have an extra long commission trying to figure out what's going <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, Commissioner, too, for for sharing. Okay, our next item is uh, uh, Supervisor Foy. This is a presentation resolution recognizing the week of October 7, 14 as Depression Awareness Week in Ventura County. I appreciate that, mm -hmm. Chair. Um, and I'd like to call Maggie Kessley back to the, mm -hmm. she's here, on that, and um, she'll be talking to us today about Depression Awareness Week being recognized. And this program is also offered by the Free Clinic Community Health Expo this weekend, so it's pretty good. You know, we look at Maggie and her, one thing about Maggie, she's, uh, you know, she's on the chamber, she does the Free Clinic, she does our board, uh, mm -hmm. uh, our commission, she does about everything else there is, besides managing, what, a million square feet of property. And oh, yeah, that. About that, too. Oh, you got a regular <laughs> job, too. And there's just goes back to, we talked about volunteers earlier. That's Some right. of these great volunteers do a lot of great stuff. So, Maggie, it's all yours and your team. Thanks. Great. Good morning Welcome, again. Maggie. It's kind of odd being on this side. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here this morning to talk about um, the free clinic of Simi Valley and an event that we put on annually every year. Um, the reason we have made a change this year is in honor of a volunteer that has been with us for the past seven years and has helped us do a run run walk every year for the past five years. Mm -hmm. um, in two. 2014, uh, Karen Finmark, she lost her nephew to suicide. Mm. Um, what we learned is that he had suffered depression from a very early age, and um, although a very brilliant young man who had a great future in front of him, uh, depression overtook him, and unfortunately he committed suicide. Karen's desire was to uh, bring awareness to the fact that depression is becoming an epidemic in our um, world and that so many people resort to suicide that we felt we wanted to bring awareness to the fact that we need to start talking about it and try to remove the stigma of um, depression from the community, from um, the county, and from our world. And I'd like to introduce you to Karen Finmark because this is the girl who's making this happen. Mm. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to recognize the county, the Board of County Supervisors for helping us to raise the level of awareness by naming this Depression Awareness Week. We truly thank you. And Fred, do you have anything to say? Because he is the Executive Director of the Free Clinic of Simi <laughs> Valley. I, I just want to also uh, ditto what Maggie just said and uh, thank you for your support on this important topic and uh, recognize that for 46 years, the clinic has provided uh, counseling services to victims uh, uh, suffering from um, depression, and uh, we look forward to continuing that in our new facility on Royal Avenue. So thank you. Again. And thank you. That, that very important subject. Thank you so much for us. Thanks, Everybody and uh, I just appreciate this. You're right, and bringing the awareness. If we could do anything, as we were taught, told that uh, Kelly said today, there's a lot of people that listen here and hear this opportunity. So, why don't we all turn around, grab this, get in the middle here. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you right. Maggie, thank you. for bringing it forward. Mm -hmm. I just uh, really uh, want to give our condolences. Uh, what a horrible thing to That's go right. through for our family. And we um, just recently lost a, a, a wonderful leader with our Surfriders Foundation, Paul Herzog, and uh, the same way. And you just realize 
it's not just the stigma, but it's also letting, um, I mean, I think a lot of people had no idea that they were facing that kind of depression. But you do find it a lot in particularly like that age, the, the, the young uh, college students, for example, and you're seeing an increase in suicide, the idea that um, they need to know that there are services out there, that there are people out there that are behind them, and we need to do all we can. So I just thank you so much for bringing this forward, and hopefully we'll get some more done in terms of that kind of outreach. Thank you. Thank you again. for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next item is, uh, I think we have Dan Hicks and uh, Susan Whitewood. Uh, and this is uh, October 2017 is the seventh annual National Substance Abuse Awareness Month, where millions of Americans and residents of Ventura County are suffering from sub substance abuse, and where substance abuse includes alcohol abuse, dependency, non-medical use of prescription drugs, abuse of over-the-counter medications, and illicit drug use. Whereas the toll of substance abuse on Ventura County is devastating, there's no regard for age, for gender, particularly endemic to the problems associated with homelessness. Whereas 13% of ninth graders and 20% of 11th graders say they use or misuse Rx painkillers. And whereas substance abuse is preventable and treatable, overdose rescue kits have been distributed countywide to more than 1,229 risk individuals since 2014, and 138 overdoses reversals have happened. Whereas Ventura County Health Care Agency and its uh, departments are dedicated to creating pathways to recovery and hope, enhancing community awareness about where to go to for help at all primary care clinics. Now, therefore, be resolved that Ventura County Board of Supervisors takes great pleasure in honoring Ventura, Healthcare, Ventura County Health Care Agency as they kick off a new campaign to create awareness around the dangers of substance abuse, combat addiction, and overdose, and provide treatment for the afflicted during the National Substance Aware Weeks Month. Dan? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, board members and Mr. Powers. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to underscore not only the severity of the problems that we uh, face here locally and as well nationally, but um, the new levels of coordination and collaboration that are happening as evidenced by your board's action this morning in approving the um, grant funds for ambulatory care. What we're going to see here in this county is uh, during the month of October and beyond uh, new levels of screening and new levels of engaging folks earlier on, working upstream. Um, all of the ambulatory care clinics will be uh, screening for substance use uh, risk. And you're also going to see public messaging, which uh, many of you already have seen about um, the, the opioid crisis we face. Um, and as the resolution shows, uh, that one in five of our high school juniors has used a prescription drug to get high, and that's a number we can change and will change. Um, we have to change if we're to address the crisis. We have to work upstream. So um, pleased to be here together with ambulatory, ambulatory care to uh, you know, take it to the next level in terms of addressing substance abuse and use um, disorders. Did you want to say, Susan? Oh. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we applied for a grant that was on the consent agenda that you approved for 100. We applied for $150,000 and we got 175000 so that's a big plus for us in this campaign. Susan, thank you. Anybody else like to share? Uh, just a close with 981-9200. Uh, uh, as the resolution says, we're trying to get people aware of where they can go for help if you or someone you love has a problem with substance, don't hesitate to call 805-981-9200. Thank you. We have a number of people here to support. Um, can you stand up? All the behavior house folks, come up. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so cool. <laughs> Oh, I'm not going to see you in a bag. <laughs> 
If you can't see the camera, they can't see you. We're good in communication. I too want to just say thank you very much for all of your efforts in so many ways that you're helping our community and also to remind people that on our prescriptions if you're not using them to please drop them off at our sheriff locations those are huge part of the problem is that they're getting access to these medications so if any way you can drop them off and get rid of your unused painkillers and RX's please go to the sheriffs and do not flush them down the toilet okay. thank you Okay, well, thank you. Well, that's the whole chamber, Sarah. <laughs> hmm. Our next item is item 27. This is um, approval and request of a tech assistance and public opinion research to be conducted and paid by the trust for the uh, trust for public land on the potential of a ballot measure on funding acquisition and protection of open space and ag land. Now, authorization of the chair of the board to sign and send a letter to TPL. So, as a Parks. Thank you. Um, this was an offer that, that it's kind of really hard to refuse, and that's the Trust for Public Land is willing to do an opinion research poll and find out what voters think about uh, paying for the acquisition of open space and farmland. And uh, looking across the state of California, this has been very successful. Uh, I've always been jealous of Sonoma, which has preserved 48,000 acres of farmland uh, through acquisition into a conservation. And then I'm also on the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, where we work with the Mountains Re Recreation and Conservation Authority. And they, too, have... A and an assessment district that has allowed for purchase of open space land in the Santa Monica Mountains in that district. So those people who live there uh, wanted their money to go towards the acquisition of open space and also wonderful things like park rangers that they can get in that area. Uh, so this opportunity uh, has presented itself. It won't cost uh, the taxpayers any money to get the information, not only doing the poll, but also giving us the ability to uh, get their analysis of the information. So I thought, well, why not? I think it's good information to have, and we can um, you know, see what the voters think. I know we have in the past uh, put a measure on the ballot specifically uh, along these lines. It got, uh, I think, a four, a little, almost 49 percent of the vote at that time back in 2004. And uh, the fact that um, generally when one wants to put something on the ballot, an, an agency like the Transportation Commission just did, uh, they actually pay for the polling. So here is an opportunity that we can get that information for free, and um, I think it's definitely worth finding out that information. And I don't know if anyone has any other comments, but happy Sir to Bennett. Yeah, yeah, I, a, a few comments. We, we did do the uh, Open Space District after the last SOAR initiative um, uh, that was out there, so um, the timing of this is sort of consistent with that. So uh, I appreciate that the Trust for Public Land is interested in doing that and, and trying to get this information, but I, I, I do want to have two pieces of information sort of out there uh, at the beginning just so we can keep uh, – uh, so, we're, so we communicate to the Trust for Public Lands, and so uh, we have a board letter already drafted. I'm not suggesting to make any changes in, in that drafting, but I would like to make sure these comments, uh, uh, at least my comments, get reflected um, to the Trust for Public Lands, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and that is, number one, in the polling that we did for the Open Space District after the SOAR initiative passed in uh, 1998, um, that polling indicated we had two-thirds support for the measure, and we ended up with 49 percent vote. Now, a real complicating factor was the fact that the Transportation Commission put a sales tax measure on at the same time, so you had two tax measures on. Um, but uh, I, also, the transportation tax um, measure poll 
uh, indicated two thirds support, um, it just just barely, and it didn't get. Uh, it ended up with fifty seven percent of the vote. So um, I, I just want to communicate to the Trust for Public Lands that that if the polling number says two thirds, it, it's easier to say you're in favor of the tax increase than it is to actually end up voting for it. And I just I just don't want to have a misunderstanding uh, with that one that's out there. The second thing is that that would ask them, you know, we're, they're not asking us to actually create the poll. I would ask them to include in their poll uh, an expansion of the recreation component there in an attempt to try to increase the chances of building support for that. Um, the recreation component, I think, is a, is a perfect match, and there is a reference to recreation in the letter. Uh, in particular, the, the, the recreation component I think that we need some funding on is this whole idea of uh, bike trails. There are some specific places. Uh, I know Ventura to Santa Paula, you know, we do not have the funding for building a trail on that easement yet. It would be uh, very beneficial for the city of Santa Paula, very beneficial for uh, residents of Ventura County to have a, a, a class one bike trail uh, there. So I'd like to uh, communicate that to the Trust for Public Lands also. Uh, appreciate Supervisor Parks for bringing this forward. Thank you very much. And Supervisor Long then, Parks. Um, yes, I wanted to ask Supervisor Parks, um, you mentioned the purchase of 40 8,000 acres of ag land. I wasn't able to find it. Um, was that land converted to other uses? Uh, this is farmland in Sonoma that was preserved so it doesn't get converted. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it completely is It ag. was purchased. So yes. the county was not in the business of, of doing ag. They leased that property no, to no, ag? No, actually it, it isn't the county that owns it or preserves it. It's a trust. Okay. Because right? that, that's what and I was I trying to understand is if the county is interested in now purchasing land based on this. Because um, I know the mm -hmm. California Conservation is purchasing land to conserve and TNC is mm -hmm. doing that. So I was wondering why we were and doing it's this. Not the, I don't think, uh, I didn't mean to imply that the county would be purchasing the land, but rather that it would be purchased. A conservancy, for example, you have the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, mm -hmm. they are the owners of, of land. So. I don't think that has been determined who would be the entity that would actually okay. have that land. For example, um, it may be that the cities also want to participate. And what's nice about this, too, is you can find out where the people are supportive. The Supervisor Bennett mentioned bike paths, and I, I immediately thought of the one between the train station and Cal State Channel Islands, right? Because that's farmland that we'd like to see preserved and also the potential of having that be a bike lane. So it, it gives that opportunity. And does P, uh, TPL need our permission to do this? They need, an, they do want to have a, a lead, like agency, to have that be on, um, the one that's asking them to do it, and then they will do it. I think that's probably part of how their funding works. But it, as I was saying, this would not be associated with tax dollars. We, I mean, we wouldn't be paying for the study ourselves. Okay. And so in, in the body of the letter, it states that um, we're going to be doing parklands. And I know we, we run that more as an enterprise and need different funding than just setting in the aside. county. In the county, right? In the county. So that's, that's what I was concerned on. And then if they're doing this on the behalf of the county, are we reviewing their questions or what I what I, I always hear surveys and you know what surveys go one way or another based on how I want them to mm -hmm. a lot of times so if I say the county wants to be looking into open space um, you know what do you feel like that and they say yeah sure but I, I want to make sure that we're not asking questions that are saying well based on SOAR initiative being passed and everyone's voting that we want open space are you for open space so there, there are things called push polls mm -hmm. that are written in such a way to get a response and this is look it will be written in such a way to find out what really is in people's Thoughts. So I don't think in what, any sense it would be a push-pull. But your question as to um, would it have input from the county, that's the question then if we want to have, I was thinking maybe the CEO's office or if they want to um, have it be the, the park GSA, but that they could be the contact with TPL on doing this. And I just wanted to point out, too, because we just came from the latest SOAR campaign, and we found that a lot of the... Um, uh, op, uh, several of the opponents would say 
why don't you just purchase the land, you know, the, the farmland? So there has been support in, in the past, even back when we did have the measure in 2004, um, with the agriculture community also supportive of this. And so I just want to say that that's a different component than what was in 2004. The idea it's not just parklands, not just open space, it's also that potential of what they have in Sonoma, which is the purchase of uh, agriculture easements, agriculture land for preservation. Okay, um, because I, you state that there is no um, cost to the county in doing this, and I always get afraid of the Trojan horse. You know, mm -hmm. it's the staff has to work with them, and maybe it goes more than we, we want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I get worried in spending that type of money when we know a nonprofit could do it themselves without taking mm -hmm. the taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm trying to make sure that we are not... Um, putting this survey or this information one-sided because it's presented by the county. This is for the county um, versus we are, we are wanting to know what the feeling yeah. is of the And, and you know, we'll see the survey questions, we'll see the answers, and we'll be able to make that judgment on, our, on ourselves. But uh, I trust the trust and, <laughs> for and public land, you know, that they're going to put together a survey to find out what voters' opinions are. And uh, if we find that you feel that the question is weighted, you know, in a particular direction, then, uh, you know, then you may not have as much um, you know, confidence in the responses. But I think the whole point of this is to give us the information, to give us, if, for example, if we want to take any action uh, any towards a ballot measure, that we have the confidence with the information that we're getting. So your first question was, you know, is someone at the county going to be able to look at this? And then the second one is, well, how much will that cost mm -hmm. to look at that? Um, I'm, I'm seeing this as they're offering to do this study, and we're giving them our blessing, essentially. You want to go do this and give us the information? We'd be very interested in looking at it. And do you okay. see us in the future wanting to, um, own, to, to put this ballot? You know, if you... If you had 90% of the people all saying yes, I definitely would be thinking about doing that. I, don't, I can't say whether we should do a ballot measure until we look at what kind of support there is. And it may be, as I was mentioning, like in the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, you have a pocket that is just 100% wanting to have an assessment, for example, for purchase of open space. Then you can just do a vote in that area. And so you're giving the voters what they want in that particular area. Or you might find it's actually, you know, broad throughout the county. But it does give you this opportunity to find out what the voters want and it not having to cost us in, in the effort. And then what is the timeline? Uh, you know, I don't know what the timeline is, so I, I can get back to you with that. I know this is the first step towards them doing that, but I would imagine it would probably be within this year. And I have, a, I have a couple of speakers. Within eight years, rather. I'm sure I'm done. Yeah. I have a couple of speakers that uh, I'd like to call up, and Sean Peronsky and also Bob Albani. Albiani. No. Good morning again, Supervisors. Um, as we talk about uh, preserving uh, lands, um, agricultural lands uh, in conservation for future generations, I think uh, one of the things we need to be mindful of as we go forward and through this process is making sure that ag is economically viable in our county. Because unless you can't economically work the land uh, in a way that is uh, profitable uh, and effective, then agricultural land conservation will ultimately not work because it, it needs to be able to be viable. So as we're going forward and then thinking about ways in the future to keep the promise of save open space and agricultural resources, uh, we need to be looking at ways to make sure that agriculture here in our county uh, is given the flexibility uh, it needs in order to be effective and be workable here in the county. Yeah, Thank you for your time. And, and Mr. Porosky, I think this uh, can very much assist that effort. And I think, uh, as I recall, uh, in Sonoma or Yolo County, you have the farmland owned by a conservancy and then the farmer being able to farm it that way. So even um, people who couldn't get into farming could get into farming because they don't have to purchase the land, which is often the case, and that they can be able to see that we have this land available for farmers. But that is a, this is, I think, one of the tools you can use to make sure that it is remains viable. Well, I know the Nature Conservancy also uh, does a little bit of farming on the land that they own in conservation, um, although they have requirements that they're eventually supposed to turn into open space. Um, I know I would love to see agriculture 
here in Ventura County of perpetuity. Uh, but you know, but again, that requires a lot of thinking about how do we allow ag to to be workable here in the county. So, thank you for your time. Thank you, Bob. Um, Bob Albiani. Good morning, supervisors. Good morning. My name is Bob Alviani, and I'm president of the Ventura County Taxpayers Association. Um, using taxpayer money for a poll to further tax the taxpayers. Mr. Alviani? Yes. If I, I just want to be clear, I don't want, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're not going to use taxpayer money for the poll. The Trust for Public Land is going to pay for the poll. Where'd that money come from? Trust for Public Land gets it from donations. From donations from taxpayers? No, well, don't, not, not taxpayer money. Citizens donate to the Trust for Public Land. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't use public money for their. Well, go, go ahead and share so that. I just, I just, I thought it might help your comments is all. But, uh, I appreciate that, yeah. Mr. Bennett. Um, I do know that, first of all, when you use the word free, there is no free. And I think that's a word that needs to be taken out of your, your vocabulary when you start talking about any monies that come from the public, any taxpayer monies that are out there. There is no free. It's coming from our own pockets. The other thing is a poll is going to tell you whatever you want that poll to say. And you can go ahead and write it any number of ways, but the poll will become the outcome that you design it to be. If it's the intention that you're going to actually put this on a, as a ballot measure, then go ahead and do so and go out and gather your signatures. But to go ahead and spend more money to do more polls and more in order to go ahead and ask the citizens if they want to be taxed again is just a great deal of waste of, of time and money to the citizenry. So not only that, but the poll also becomes political cover for, for your board. Because you'll go ahead and do the poll and you'll say, look, it was 98%. And then however the outcome will come out, you'll go ahead and determine, well, yeah, but we had the poll. So it, it is just a waste of time and money to go ahead and go through these procedures in order to go ahead and come to a determination for something that you're already determined to do as it is. So um, we just feel that, you know, the money should be for the money that was given to the uh, PTL should go ahead and be spent, not necessarily on polls like this, but for the original determination that they had collected that money to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albion. Um, Supervisor Bennett, if, if I could, now that we finish the public comment, that the, we're, we're done. The concern that I'm, uh, the, the, the biggest concern I have is, is, is uh, expectations, uh, false expectations getting created, um, because I think there is some, some accuracy in that, uh, the, the, the poll. So I just want to communicate to the Trust for Public Lands that, um, you know, the, the more there is a sense that the poll truly is objective, it's important. But uh, uh, more importantly, regardless of the poll's outcome, we have to really do hard analysis in terms of uh, whether it's appropriate to go forward. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll do that, but I just want to make sure that uh, expectations stay in line. Two-thirds vote is very, very difficult to get mm -hmm. for a tax increase here in Ventura County. Thank you. So, so. And if I can just comment also, the California Conservancy and TNC are doing a great job in purchasing land and, mm -hmm. and keeping it open space or agriculture and so forth. So wherever this vote goes, I just want to make sure that you know that, mm -hmm. that is, they're doing a great job. Is that a motion? Okay, so let me, let me just real quick, uh, let me just say, uh, the TPL has the right to do whatever they want to do. They can do a poll, they can do their thing, and I think that's, that, that's fine for if they want to do that, and any organization could do that. I do believe that we, by endorsing that, I go back to yours, Supervisor Bennett, it puts a false expectation on the people, and I think that, and what that does is saying, well, 
the Board of Supervisors has put his, as Supervisor Park said, you know, kind of the lead agency, that puts a false thing. Oh, the Board wants this, so maybe I should say yes. But as we know, when you get down to it, everybody can say yes, but nobody really wants to tax themselves for those kinds of things. So I, I think if they're going to do this, let them do it on their own without us doing it. And, um, and I know that's why they want it, because it helps the poll. And the poll looks good. That, but that's a, that's a false expectation for us to be out there doing those kinds of things. And I think it's not fair to the people when they're going to, because I guarantee they're going to say, oh, the Board of Supervisors asked us to do this. And that's, and that's not true. Because again, if it came back and it said, you know, 69% say, this is what we want to do, because we saw in the transportation poll, those polls, when you, it always sounds good to say something until it really comes down to me wanting to tax myself to do it. And, uh, and I think the gentleman there says, you know, don't waste their, their money on that. But, you know, it's their money. They get the donations. They can do what they want with it. So I just don't see it as valuable, and I wouldn't want us here to endorse something like that. Mm -hmm. But the TPL is paying for it, right? Yeah, it, it is being paid for by TPL and not with tax dollars. And just I just wonder if the concern is more what we're asking about, which is do the voters want to spend their own money to purchase open space and farmland? Or if I, this I was, do we want to ask the voters, do they want traffic signals on uh, Santa Rosa Road, which we did, and over 70% said yes, please mm -hmm. tax me, I want these signals. Or in Nyland Acres, yes, please tax me, I want to have this you know, uh, facility for the kids. So I think this is asking the board, do you want to know what the voters think about this? And our, question, and, and our response is, sure, it does no harm for us to find out what the voters think of this. If you're concerned that the voters actually may come up with uh, a large number wanting it, and that we will then be pressured to consider doing something, you know, I, I can understand that if you don't like what that thing is that we may end up doing. <laughs> so I, I can understand that, but at this point, all you're being asked for is, do you want that. this information? It's just we shouldn't endorse it to try to make a false okay. number on a, a poll. That's okay. Right. This is a, a supermajority if we do go that route. Right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, generally it is, but I know there has be been some recent um, loss okay, court so cases. So what do we I would go ahead and, and make the motion. Okay. Please vote. Okay, and that's approved. Okay, our next item is item 28. Oh, I'm sorry, go back I, I, to 25. No, no, I, I think Mr. Power said something he wanted I'm sorry, to do. Let's go back 25. to 25. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chairs. I'm going to board members. Uh, since we have our, our friends from the uh, Semi Free Clinic here, uh, Fred and Maggie and all, uh, we just want to let you know uh, we're very pleased to report to you that the, the lease uh, has been worked out. Okay. And so it's just a matter of uh, bringing it to uh, the board here uh, November 7th, which we will do. And uh, really appreciate your work, Scott Powers, Brian Miller, uh, County Council. Uh, there were a lot of deal points here, uh, but they got it worked out. So just uh, really appreciate the partnership. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, great. So and, I, and I appreciate that, Mike, and I appreciate the team doing that. And, and for all of you out there, I know it's been a long coming and the opportunity of this. And I know this board wants to see the services that you continue to provide and uh, that you're not asking for us to throw money, not to, but you just want an opportunity to do what you've been doing for I don't know how many decades now. So congratulations, and again, thanks to the county for all the hard work and the rest of the supervisors here. The, so. And the free clinic just opened up some uh, dental chairs, correct? Yes. Awesome. And that, that is just wonderful that you're able to do that with in coordination with our health care agencies. So yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So thank you what you're doing. So anyway, just I'm glad. Appreciate that, Mike, letting them know here publicly. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Okay, our next item is item 28. This is receiving file. Information on the annual review by Board of Supervisors, accounts of funds containing developer fees. Uh, good morning, Chair Zaragoza, members of the board, and Mr. Powers. For the record, my name is Jill Ward, and I'm a deputy director in the Auditor Controller's Office. I'm here today to ask that you receive the information in Exhibits 1, 2, 3, yeah. and 4 regarding the County of Ventura developer fees that is required by government code. The information was compiled by our office based on information provided to us from the departments that administer the developer fees. We will return to your board at a future meeting uh, currently scheduled for November 7th to complete the review process. I am available to answer questions and I believe we have representatives from the various departments as well. Any questions? No. How about a motion? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Please vote. Okay, that's approved. Thank you so much. Our next item is uh, item 29, the receive and file the investments, including market values for investments for the year um, ending July 31, 2017 to August 31, 2017. Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Give us some good news. <laughs> Actually, I have some. Good. If you'll allow me to put on my tax collector hat for just a moment. Uh, we were successful in closing negotiations with our credit card payment provider last week and managed to get it implemented into the uh, cashiering system so that people who use electronic checks, the fee to the which all goes straight to the provider, has gone down from $2 to a dollar and a half. And the rate for using a credit card uh, has gone down from 2.35% to 2.15%. Those numbers, if they had been in effect during the last fiscal year, would have saved taxpayers in Ventura County about $320,000. And we anticipate that as the uh, percentage of taxpayers who pay by credit card increases, which it does about a half point per year, and as the assessed roll has increased, that it will save taxpayers on the order of 350 to 360,000 this fiscal year. So it's very good. Mm -hmm. It's still. It just this is the first uh, decrease we've been able to negotiate since 2011. The first thing that I did that I thought was a success when I came aboard was getting a decrease from 265 to 235. And I thought this is great. I'll get one of these every year, and life would be great. But uh, every six years, I guess, is about what they're willing to do. So that's maybe, news maybe, from the maybe tax next, collector. Maybe next year you can take the rest of the county and add that volume <laughs> on top and get some more rate reduction. Well, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. My real purpose here today is to present to you a two-month report for July and August of 2017 on the results um, of the investment pool operations. Uh, it is a report that shows continuing upswing in yield, both actual and percentage, uh, during a period of the year where not much is going on with the investment pool except withdrawals by agencies that are using their money. We have uh, opened an account for the City of Oxnard after a year of uh, working with them, mm. which um, will be funded at a comparatively low level uh, compared, say, to the city of Moorpark, but uh, we have hopes that they'll be able to uh, supply more. It appears to me that there will be a rate increase in December uh, from the Federal Open Market Committee, so that's being priced into the market right now which means that yields in our sectors are increasing and you're likely actually I this morning I finished writing the next report that will be delivered in November so, and I know what it says so I don't have to guess that uh, there will be significant increases in percentage yield and actual yield during the month of October so now you know everything I know. And, Your Honor, I, the, I, in the city of Oxford, I understand they had millions of dollars that were not earning any, any dollars at all. Is that and with your assistance now? My impression is that there are maybe over $100 million in various Oxnard city funds in banks. Well... Thank you, thank you, Supervisor. Um, Mr. Hintz, I just wanted to say thank you again for meeting with myself and my staff to let us understand 
what the tax collector world is mm -hmm. and all the different things that you do on a daily basis. Um, I do appreciate uh, reducing that percentage. Thank you. Thank you. I know yeah. there's a huge amount of people that actually need to pay by credit card for one reason or another. And to have that option and that that is an increase, a decrease, um, that will help them a lot. So I appreciate that we're getting up to speed with technology and so forth and, and making it easier for our consumers, our constituents, to have to pay these. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Supervisor. Thank you, the fact is that paying by credit card is the only way that taxpayers can make payments. Otherwise, everybody has to pay two installments. But mm -hmm. if you want to pay a monthly payment, the only way to accomplish that. that is by credit card. So you can pay you can pay monthly on your credit card. Oh, well, of course, pay. okay. But you pay right yeah, up front, you, and you then you can okay. pay you can pay Visa every month, but you can't okay. pay me at a high interest because yeah. I can't take at a real high interest <laughs> in two payments. So. <clears throat> The, the credit card charge is one of the three major complaints that I get. That's um, right. The first is, why is my property assessed so high? And I just point them across the, the to Dan. plaza. <laughs> and the other is, what are all of these mosquito <laughs> abatement districts? And I refer all of them to the auditor controller. And the third I can't get away from, and that's the cost of using a credit card. <laughs> So this is a receive and file item. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I so make we a get a first <clears throat> and, a, and a second. Please vote. And that's approved. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next, our next item is a public hearing, uh, and this is uh, adoption of a resolution approving a tax-exempt bond financing for the benefit of Waste Management Incorporated. To provide financing for of improvements to the existing landfill, Christy. Good morning. My name is Christy Madden with the County Executive Office. Um, we are here to request that your board conduct a Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, otherwise known as a TEFRA hearing. Waste management has requested up to $100 million in tax-exempt bond financing through the California Municipal Finance Authority. A portion of that funds of those funds will be used for permitted improvements at the Simi Valley Landfill. The county's been a member of the authority since 2007, and the issuance of bonds does not impact the county's credit eligibility for other tax-exempt financing in any way. Uh, we recommend that you conduct the hearing and subsequently approve the resolution. We do have uh, Scott Tignac, is that how I pronounce it, uh, mm -hmm. from Waste Management and John Stoker with the Finance Authority, if you have any questions for that. Well, okay, this is a public hearing. I don't have any speaker cards. So uh, anybody like to speak on this item? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Could you um, tell me how an a entity that wants to utilize this benefit would know about it? And is there any kind of outreach that goes on? <laughs> I I'm looked, turning the and I looked at the website <laughs> and I saw such wonderful projects. You know, a lot of affordable housing projects, hospitals being mm -hmm. built, and the like. So I was just interested to know who uh, who gets the information. They know that they can uh, apply. Yes, ma'am. John Stoker with the California Municipal Finance Authority. Um, really, it's all driven by the tax code, and, and Congress has determined what can what kinds of projects can be financed tax exempt. We. We do have outreach. There's a number of different organizations that do that. It's, it's generally public benefit kind of projects. So as you said, affordable housing, hospitals, all 501c3s, and then the, the pollution control waste management, obviously that, that affects everybody, and, and that's why Congress allows it to be financed that way. So um, there's a number of different from state agencies to local agencies that, that reach out to entities that can okay. access. Okay, so it's the municipalities themselves that can let entities in their jurisdictions know about the potential so they can put forward these kind of projects that help the public. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. I figure okay. since he came all the way here, we should uh, ask him a question, I right? It's a pl pleasure of the board. So is the, the public hearing is closed. I'll make a motion. Okay, we're closed. In a second. Please vote. You're approved. Thank you. Thank you for 
Okay, our last item here is um, it's 11 o'clock. Yep. It's the receiving file of Beacon Award presentation from the Ventura County Regional Energy Alliance to the County of Ventura. Good morning, Chair Zaragoza, members of the board, Mr. Powers, for the record, Sue Hughes with the CEO's office. Although today I'm here in the capacity as staff to Ventura County Regional Energy <laughs> Alliance. And um, we, we are here with two fun, two fun things. Um, first of all, just to explain a little bit about the Beacon Awards. The Beacon program was created by the Institute for Local Government. And um, it's to assist local governments in producing measurable achievements in five areas. Those areas are agency greenhouse gas reductions, community greenhouse gas reductions, agency energy savings, natural gas savings, and sustainability best practices. So Ventura County Regional Energy Alliance, we um, have two awards actually to present to um, the county at a different level. Um, the very first one, I would like to um, have Mr. Zaragoza, Supervisor Zaragoza, come down. This is the um, Beacon, the Platinum Beacon Spotlight Award, and it's for countywide sustainability best practices. It means that the county has adopted policies and practices that contribute to a more sustainable community. To qualify, the county has completed activities in 10 areas of the Institute's sustainability best practices framework. The areas include energy efficiency and conservation, water and wastewater systems, renewable energy, and low carbon fuels and efficient transportation. So this award goes to the county overall and um, we very much appreciate how important this is to your board and the energy efficiency um, programs that we're able to um, participate in with the County of Ventura wearing the hat of VCREA. So um, at this time, Supervisor Zaragoza, on behalf of VCREA, we'd like to award the County of Ventura the Platinum Level Beacon Spotlight Award. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. Thank you to the Beacon. There's two beacons. I belong to the Beacon over <laughs> in the Beach of Ocean over JPA, but this is a good beacon. Thank you so this much. This is the other beacon. The other beacon. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to let you uh, hang this up. Oh, no, I think no, we're taking a photo. picture. Okay. Right here. So we can get the... Okay. Thank you. That's the first That'll one. That'll go on our website. Right. That's the first one. Okay. Do I get another one? Give me the other one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second award is... Um, is being presented to the County of Ventura General Services Agency. Um, they are receiving the Gold Spotlight Award for Agency Greenhouse Gas Reductions. Um, this is in, just to make a, a little clarification, this is in GSA maintained facilities mm -hmm. only and it's for mobile emissions and it's reduction numbers that were provided um, by Southern California Gas and Southern mm -hmm. California Edison and it's based on the baseline use for the energy leadership um, program from 2006. So this year's Beacon Spotlight Award question. being presented by VCREA, it goes to the County of Ventura um, gold level. So Mr. Sasek, if there's anything you'd like to say besides, hey, thanks for my award. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, would you snap a, or Greg or someone? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, we thank you for your um, participation in VCREA and in all our sustainability efforts. Thank you, Sue. I know Michael, uh, Michael Sue. Oh, I was just saying that we also had some other uh, awardees. We had the uh, annual awards ceremony, as it were. And uh, I think the city of Ventura was one that also got an yes. award, uh, award for their sustainability program and a few other uh, municipalities throughout our county. We love giving awards. Michael? Well, I, I think there's just there's a lot of work going on in the energy department. You can see the team here with Sue and Kelly and Heather. Uh, but GSA, every day, you guys are doing this, Dave and Greg. Whether it's fleet or solar or some kind of other sustainability practice, empower out in the community, helping homeowners. So there's a lot going on. You go to this VCRA board meeting, and I went to one a few months ago. It's, there's a lot of good representation on there. You're very engaged. Supervisor Parks is on there. I mean, it, there's, there's good things happening. So good job. Good momentum. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to say thank you to the staff of VCREA. Totally forgot them. And 
I sign a lot of documents. They do all the really brainy work. They, they're in the weeds with all the details. So thanks to the staff at VCRA. And thank you on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. That's our last item. We have, we did correspond. Didn't we? So we have closed session. Any announcements? Uh, uh, oh, correspondence, excuse me. Okay. Don't, yes. <laughs> That's right. 39. <laughs> All right, Brian. Can we say? Well, so we, we, may, we may have an announcement. Board members, we might have an announcement. We might have an announcement. <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to close session. Leroy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number 36, initiation of litigation. The board approved the initiation of, of litigation against J&H Engineering uh, in a subrogation claim that the county has the, arising out of a workers' compensation matter. And the uh, vote of the board was five to zero. Yep. And that's, that's uh, all we have on that. So with that, we would have no other announcements. So we go back to closed session and we'll adjourn from closed session. Yes. Okay, thank you.